I will hand over to Dan, but a little introduction first. So I'll just have to test my memory because it was all on the slide so that I could cheat and read it off for you. So again, being the meeting's being recorded, welcome particularly to the regional people. If you have problems with your internet dropping out, I will keep trying to readmit you to the meeting. Um, and you're most welcome to um, text me or email me if I forget to do that, but that should happen. Now, Dan is the practitioner at um, Vet Skin and Ear. He has been studying dermatology-related um, subjects in Europe for quite some time, which means that he is well up to date with the new things that are happening there. And uh, he is, so he'll probably need to correct me when he goes through and does his bio, that he studied at the L University of Luxembourg and is accredited um, your your um, mic is on Dan if you want to fix it uh, and he's certified a, a through a different university yes yes so, so studied through the University of Vienna and certified through Luxembourg but um, basically next door to each other so uh, yeah but I'll go through all that I'm actually going to show you some photographs of the university and um, just for a bit of entertainment because it's a pretty amazing uh, facility um, I'm happy with Mark to take over. Hey. It's really exciting to have, um, I'll just try and block out my noisy puppies. Um, it's really exciting to uh, have you here tonight. As I did some research, I have discovered that you have other very interesting um, hobbies, cave diving and other things that take you around the world. So it'll be most interesting to hear your perspective on things. I will let um, Dan explain how he wants to set up the evening, but basically there'll be a presentation, um, perhaps a bit of a breather somewhere along the line, plenty of time for Q&As at the end of the meeting, um, and hopefully um, I might get my screen share back again while Dan's presenting, so I will now... Uh, welcome, Dan, and hand over to him, and good luck with your screen share. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Um, welcome to everybody. Thanks for um, giving up your Thursday night to um, hopefully learn a little bit more about um, allergies. Um, as Mark said, I've um, been studying for some time over in Europe, uh, and uh, it's been a real joy, especially to study in places like um, Vienna and uh, um, also, to have to go over to Luxembourg for university for, for exams and tuition, like that's a real luxury. And um, it's been a, you could say it's a bit, a bit of a demand to have to go overseas to study, but there's really nothing offered like that in in Australia. And also um, to study in Europe, and, and it is just such a beautiful thing to do. Um, we certainly look forward to Fridays where we can go and do some some fun stuff. Um, so. Um, what I thought I'd do is whiz you through a um, bit of a brief on me, the way I work. Um, something I thought was quite important is basically the way dermatology works in practice. And I think a lot of clients, it, it takes a bit, of, a bit of a learning process to understand it's a different sort of practice to what you might be used to being, uh, experiencing at your regular vet. It's, it's a totally different way for me to work. Um, and, and it's a really a nice way to work. And I think we get a lot more time together. Uh, so I thought I'd explain a little bit about that and also um, obviously go through a lot on allergy with you, food allergy, dispel some of the myths that you um, may have uh, come across and also um, explain a little bit of ATP um, and the way we diagnose ATP, the way we work with ATP and also just try to make this entertaining. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll march on, I'll just um, get started. But um, uh, yeah, I guess the thing with, with this discussion is that um, not everything in dermatology or in medicine is known and concrete, okay? But I'm really happy all the time and I always have been a vet, been a vet for nearly 20 years and really happy to say to people, look, I don't know the answer to this if I don't know. 
Um, I'd rather do that than, than fluff my way along and, um, and lead you up the garden path and never know the answer myself. So if you guys have questions that you think are, are really unusual or remote or you think, oh, I'm the only one who doesn't understand this, please just shout out because I'd rather you guys understood this all the way along. And even if it comes to later on, you want to email me about something or call me out, just do it because I'm really big on sharing information. Most of the time I learn something along the way as well. Anyway, we'll jump in. Um, I'm just going to set myself a bit of a timer because um, I have a tendency to take a little bit longer than planned sometimes with some things. So, all right. So, okay. So, uh, I was just going to jump on and put you into my screen. Now, hopefully, you guys. Probably lost me by now. Okay, you can see me. Okay. Everyone can hear me okay? Yep. Okay, good, thanks. <laughs> All right, so um, I operate in around Melbourne, um, Geelong, Frankston, um, and uh, through to Cheltenham, um, sometimes I go into Warrigal, but mostly Geelong, Flemington, Cheltenham, and then um, now and then I'll do some trips out and about. Um, so um, that's really what I do. Um, tonight's all about um, food allergy A to B. Uh, I'll try and um, run through some of the stuff quite quickly that's not so important. And um, some of the stuff I think that is more important, I'll, um, I'll spend some more time on. Some of the content you're going you're to find is quite scientific. And um, I'd rather not dwell on that because um, I think um, yeah, I don't want you guys to feel like you have to understand every detail. This is supposed to be entertaining as well. You know, I, I don't want to make this too heavy. But I also don't want to, um, I guess, it make, make it too simplified because um, there is an element of science in all of this and all of the work we do as dermatologists needs to be evidence-based, you know, and so I've tried to instill this with evidence. So this is my training. Basically, I've um, certified through the University of Luxembourg um, uh, and uh, I've prior to that been um, in small animal practice for everything I've worked at the university, teaching students. Um, I've been in welfare, I worked at Lord Smith for a number of years, worked at RSPCA, um, uh, and, uh, and I also had my own private clinic after about uh, six years. Um, and then um, later, later on, about six, six, six years ago, I started studying dermatology um, because I really wanted to get better at something that not many people were very good at and, and something I've struggled with a lot. You know, it's a really tricky field. Um, and I was coming across so many cases that I'll admit at the time I was um, struggling with and there really weren't many people to turn to for help. Um, I've got a really good um, friend and colleague, um, Robert Hilton, and he and I talk on a daily basis about a lot of things, but we talk a lot about skin cases. And also I talk with some other guys over at MBSC, which is a special centre over in Glen Waverley. We can touch quite a bit. So dermatology is a little bit different to general practice in that there's quite a bit of sharing of ideas, which is really refreshing. Um, we um, we communicate pretty freely um, about cases. So I'll bring up Greg Burton or David Robson or, or some of the guys at NBSC or I'll ring Rob Hilton and we'll talk about a case. And we've also got this worldwide list server, which is basically a dermatology email list. And each day there'll be you know 10 or 15 emails put up all around the world of cases people have that are quirky. Um, dermatology is hard and it really is. It's not an easy discipline, um, but you can benefit a lot from other people's experiences. Okay, so, so this is what I do, a bit about what I do, okay. Um, all the instruction I've had has been from, um, not even arguably, but um, well-known um, fact that they're the world's best dermatologists. So I'm really privileged in that regard. I've put a lot of time and a lot of um, financial investment into getting the right training, and that's been really great. Um, and I'll just show you through some of the facilities. Um, so this is the University of Luxembourg, oh, sorry, University of Vienna rather. And this is out of my bedroom window where I was uh, staying in the student quarters um, for some time. Um, this looks a bit like a nuclear power plant actually. <laughs> but uh, it's not bad inside. Um, so 
the board through of which through which I've, I've um, done my studies is called the Uni Uni European School for Advanced Veterinary Studies, um, and they're based in Luxembourg. And the, the training uh, base is actually University of Vienna. Um, so the courses run over three years. Uh, a lot of practical uh, emphasis, a lot of lab work, a lot of casework. We get clients that bring their animals into the university, and they are real cases, much like being a student at the University of Melbourne. Say you'll have clients bring their animals in with all sorts of curly wurly skin conditions, and um, we'll put them over the table as a group. The client will often be there in the in the, in the room, which is quite interactive for them, and. Um, yeah, they become your cases for the for the course, which is pretty fun. And there's a lot of lecture work. Um, so it's basically one course a year we ran um, and uh, a lot of, lot of lectures to sit through, a lot of practical sessions, but really interactive and really fun and a lot of really nice ideas sharing. Like even my lecturers now that, that are from the US and UK and Europe, I can email them today about a case and we've even got cases we're sort of co-managing and uh, it's really lovely because it's a real sharing environment whereas private practice in australia and all around the world is quite a competitive field it's a different atmosphere dermatology across all the disciplines you know we've got this um this uh thing we call science week each week which is you know that's what all this is about it's a this is our uh, magazine for science week which is a big gathering we have up on the gold coast and it's not just for vets but it's for all, all manners of scientists um and that's a collaboration of scientists, but you'll see a lot of the different faculties of scientists that collaborate at those events don't really um, convene a great deal between the meetings. And dermatology is different in that regard. There's a lot of, a lot of you know, cross communication. Anyway, I'll push on. Um, basically, a lot of work involved, um, but really rewarding work. I've been able to go to Sydney, go to some practices in Melbourne that do really good dermatology work, um, and also to some overseas. I've been over to Europe. Um, into Italy and, um, and also to uh, Prague and uh, Poland, some really great dermatology practices. <clears throat> a lot of study to do, some, some cases to prepare. Um, they've all got to be documented and photographed and then they get reviewed as part of your assessment. So that's what all this assessment was about, this certification process, um, which was um, pretty lengthy. The oral exams were horrendous. Um, and I think this was actually much harder than graduating as a vet. Um, and I think my brain being 20 years older has not helped things either. But anyway, this is what I've achieved, this uh, advanced uh, clinical scientist in uh, advanced uh, veterinary practice and uh, dermatology. Um, and that's um, something we're pretty proud of. Um, I'm not a registered specialist. And I just, I think you guys need to be aware of that. Um, we do have registered specialists down in Mount Waverley um, uh, at NDSC and they need to be um, recognised for their achievements too. And um, there's certainly people that are a wealth of information too. Um, I like to think um, myself and Rob do uh, a very high standard of work and, and I think it's well up there with all the specialists we have in Australia. So, uh, and certainly um, we do lean on each other if we, we aren't sure of what's going on with the case. This is the University of uh, Vienna. Um, so this is fairly close to, to town. Uh, it's you know, quite a busy street here. Um, it's about four kilometres out from the city centre. And there, on the average day, there'd be 30 horse floats going in there. And and, um, and there's not just horses in these, there's cows in there too, you know. So there's large animals, small animals, there's exotics in here. This place is really huge. Uh, they've got the only um, uh, radiation treatment facility in, uh, Vienna at the university and there actually aren't many of those in Europe. They've got really wonderful facilities. So I just thought I'd give you a bit of a tour of this first. So this is sort of, this is our practical theatre where we do a lot of our pracs um, and you can see there's, um, you know, we, we walked horses in here. We did a lot of, walk, lot, lot of work on uh, equine skin testing um, and uh, allergy work with horses in here and had a lot of clients come in here with their animals on the average day. So we've been here about twice a week. Um, and this is the microscope uh, sessions. You can see there aren't many males in there. <laughs> and it's a bit like the Australian ratio. You know, I think there were three or four guys in our course of um, 45. Lectures, everyone's familiar with lectures, I guess. Um, uh, it was interesting, this lecture theater was right next door to a, um, the mouse colony where they were doing uh, research on them. Uh, a Hendra virus vaccine actually for, for horses using um, mice as a 
a research tool. And so on a hot afternoon, which it was always hot in here, um, the mouse urine was unbearable to smell. <laughs> so we really needed some fresh air, but we couldn't get enough through there. Anyway, uh, this is Dr. David Lloyd, uh, uh, Professor, rather David Lloyd. He's um, from the uh, University of um, uh, UK, uh, Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons. Um, he's probably one of the best known dermatologists in the world and he was our chief um, lecturer for the whole three years. A wonderful man um, and uh, he's certainly somebody that uh, is very approachable. Um, this is the sort of thing we do in the practice and everyone really gets to know each other. We have, we have lunch together, we, we get together in you know, practical classes and then we go out for dinner together. Everyone's very, very much a close-knit sort of family. It's really nice. More stuff. So here we're scoping um, ears, doing a lot of endoscopy and um, otoscopy on brains and skulls. Um, more lectures, more practical sessions. So, and there we are. So I just thought I'd whiz you through um, some of the things I do. Uh, basically, uh, you probably everybody's familiar with dermatology, I'm sure, and general general sort of um, work that goes on. Um, I do a lot of allergy testing. Um, any sort of allergy workup. Um, whether it's food allergy, environmental allergies, um, creating vaccines for immunotherapy, uh, which is basically where we're desensitising the body to all the agents they might be allergic to. Um, I do a lot with ears, and I think ears are really rewarding. A lot of clients come to me with these horrendous ear problems, and uh, I can make a real impact there, um, either to cure them or, or um, certainly to help people manage them better. A lot of animals have middle ear disease that vets don't know is there and the clients certainly didn't know was there. So we do a lot of tympanostomy, which is basically puncturing the eardrum or, and letting an infection out of the middle ear, flushing the middle ear out, maybe putting grommets in the middle ear, that kind of thing. Um, so that's really rewarding stuff, you know, getting animals hearing back or getting chronic pain go away is just wonderful. I really enjoy that. That's quite a kick. Um, a lot of foot disease, a lot of anal sac disease. Anyone who's got a German Shepherd, Please don't take this the wrong way, but I see plenty of shepherds with bottom disease and they get really good results. Um, about 80% of what I do and what the average dermatologist does is going to be allergy, okay? And dealing with problems that I think um, their general vet has struggled with or, or, or needed extra help with. And then we get the quirky stuff, which is, um, you know, all the autoimmune diseases. Um, so can you hear me there, Mark? Yep. No, it's sounding really good. Sounding yeah. really good. Can you, see, can you see my mouse here? Yes, we can see your mouse. That's all right. So I can use it as a bit of a pointer if I need to. Um, so, yeah, the, the quirky stuff, which is, I guess, in dermatology, we see is sort of the, the exciting stuff, um, is all the autoimmune diseases, you know. So you've probably seen a lot of these conditions. You might have heard a lot of the terminology, but, you know, the vasculitis is pemphigus, um, um, erythemas. Um, this sort of stuff yesterday I had a, a Jackson that had a, um, an unusual um, pigmenting condition, for example. That's the, that's the stuff that kind of makes you get out of bed every day to, to, to see something new is really exciting or something that's a different presentation, something you don't see very often. So that's, that's a really exciting stuff. And if someone calls me up with a quirky case, I'm like, geez, I'll, I'll, put, I'll put you in my lunch break because <laughs> that gives me a real kick and, um, and it's really exciting to to get to the root of the problem and get a diagnosis, but then also start treating something that's exceptionally rare. Um, at the moment, I've got some really rare cases um, going on, which um, uh, there's only, you know, probably 15 or 20 being treated around the world at the moment. Um, I know that because we all talk to each other, all dermatologists. Um, so that's pretty exciting stuff. Um, we deal with a lot of MRSP now, so multi-resistant staph, as we call it. Um, unfortunately, you're going to go to the vet, they're going to give you a lot of antibiotics. Um, I'm really anti-antibiotics um, as much as I can be. And everybody should be these days. All the vets should be. All the human doctors should be. Uh, unfortunately, now we're seeing so many cases of multi-resistant bacteria that we've now devised sort of management plans on how to deal with cases when they pop up. And, you know, I probably see three or four cases a week that are significant problems that um, basically are not going to respond to any antibiotics. Okay, and you've got to have strategies in place for that. Um, there's some emerging technologies that we're working on as well. So um, now I'm creating a lot of vaccines to desensitise dogs to their own bacteria 
and to, to build their immunity. So, for example, I've got uh, two German Shepherds at the moment and a, um, a German wirehead pointer that all have uh, recurrent pyoderma, recurrent hotspots that has been, um, I guess, worked up in a way that we've ruled out all the common causes of um, poor immunity. Uh, for example, thyroid disease, Cushing's disease, um, allergy, uh, everything in that regard is under control. These dogs just keep getting recurrent pyodermas and German shepherds are um, genetically predisposed to that condition. Um, now we're making vaccines that will actually um, prime the body to defend against the um, bacterium so that we're basically creating immunity where, immunity where there was a gap before. So that's pretty fun stuff. Um, I just, I guess I just wanted to let you guys know that anything I say in this um, presentation about particular breeds, please don't take it personally when it comes to your breed. It's easy to, I think, and it's easy to um, take it as maybe a personal attack on the breed. There are conditions we see in, in, in certain breeds of animals that are well documented to be um, what we call conditions that that breed is predisposed to genetically because we've seen so many cases. And uh, if you want any further information on breed predisposition, I can send you a whole breed, a breed a predisposition list um, for every breed of dog, because uh, it's quite an interesting field. You know, if I get, for example, you know, a Hungarian visual coming in here, um, you know, there's there's really only a couple of conditions they get which um, they're predisposed to. This dog down here, for example, it's a, it's a um, uh, I think it was another visual actually, uh, with a vasculitis post vaccine. This dog here is a German short-haired pointer and he's got a, a condition called exfoliative cutaneous lupus, uh, which is exceptionally rare. As, that's the condition I'm sort of saying at the moment. I think there's only about 15 or 20 cases in the world that have been treated. Um, and he's responding really well. You can see all of his skin basically all over the whole body has fallen off. Um, treating a dingo with a ruptured eardrum at the moment. One eardrum, we've flushed the middle ear out. It's going well. I'm going to catch up with her next week. Uh, it's been on six weeks of treatment. The eardrum's come back. The dog's hearing's come back. He's still trying to bite his own every time she medicates the ear. And she's got photographs of her arms to show me, <laughs> which is quite interesting. You know, these chronic ears, this kind of thing here, we're dealing with a lot of this. So that's either going to be a surgical case or sometimes we'll manage them. Um, this is another vasculitis case. Uh, where we've got bowed out toenails. This, this actually, it's this dog here, the same dog, um, responding to a vaccine adversely as a puppy. So this dog was 10 weeks old when I diagnosed the vasculitis, responding to a vaccine adversely. Here we've got a dog that's um, had um, uh, what we call um, colour dilution alopecia. So it's a staffy with you know, alopecia just related to its hair colour. Um, you know, there's another cat here, cat with um, feline herpes virus um, and what we call pemphigus foliaceus, which is an autoimmune disease together. And this is one that our um, another practice in Melbourne had really struggled with for a long time. And the cat came to me and, um, and had these two conditions. It actually wasn't too hard to turn it around. Um, so some of those cases can be really rewarding, the chronic ones that, you know, really progressed and you think, gosh, how am I going to manage this? And... You just go stepwise, stepwise approach and you can make a lot of difference. You know, diabetics here with recurrent pyodermas, cats with allergy, dogs with allergy. So, and a lot of allergy testing, so allergy testing on dogs that I do, um, allergy testing on horses too. So it's a, an equine test there. Uh, but yeah, interesting stuff. Um, I don't want to bore you too much with, um, I guess, what I deem good dermatology, but Good dermatology is what you get when you go to see a dermatologist. It's got to be done right. So if you come to me or you come to Rob or you go to MBSC or you go up to SASH in Sydney, you're going to get a workup that is done completely, basically from what we call sort of the ground up. Okay, so we've got to start with a good database. It's a scientific approach. You need a baseline of information. You can't take shortcuts. Okay. Um, I guess the other big consideration I've got is that, and I've learned this along the way with, with being a vet for a long time, a general vet, it's quite different. You know, the visits are very short. With dermatology, the visits are somewhat longer and there's a lot more work involved um, along the way together. So it's really important to have that um, sort of team mentality. So I've got to make sure that I educate all of my clients about the disease, obviously, the, the diagnostics, whether we've got a definitive diagnosis 
and also not just say this is how we're going to do things but understand what you guys are capable of what you can afford what you've got time to do there's no good in good in me sending you home with 10 treatments during a day if, if you've only got time for three and on the other end also is that you know not everybody um has um the ability to to afford that um I guess the other thing is some people's expectations are 10 out of 10. Sometimes their ability to follow through is 2 out of 10. And we've got to meet in the middle there and say, well, the expected outcome is going to be this. So it's, it's really good to understand that from the start so I can tailor the treatment um, to be effective and useful for everybody. But also it's important that um, we re revisit that along the way and, and sort of remodel it if we need to. <clears throat> Sometimes we don't fix things, we manage them especially with some of the autoimmune diseases. So um, we call it the 80-20 rule. So often the last 20% of perfecting a case, such as something like a vasculitis that's going to be there for life, well, sometimes the last 20% might kill the patient. Okay, So we've got to balance, um, I guess, treatment uh, effectiveness and, and appearance with health cost overall. Okay, We call it a condition... Um, uh, where, where basically we're putting too much pressure on a client or a client's feeling like there's too much to do. This is recognised across the human healthcare sector. Um, is We call it caregiver burden, um, a, co a concept of basically a carer for an animal in this context just has too much to do. So I, I'll make sure I give you guys a bit of a, a survey at the start just to, um, uh, I guess, point out your, your abilities and what you can, you know, what you can handle. And also, I need to recognise that I'm a bit of a perfectionist, I think most vets are, but that life matters get in the way of treatment, you know, and I've got to be able to roll with the punches and I've got to be there for you on the phone. And I've, I've spent a big part of my day today just supporting clients on the phone, which is really important because there's no good in us just treating an animal, you know, seeing you for the visits and then sending you off into the wilderness and saying, we'll see you in two weeks. You know, So I, I make sure I'm there for everybody and uh, it's what needs to be done. So with all the visits, I just, I just, I'm always on the phone if you need help. So it's really important. And also keep your vet in the loop. So if you run out of drugs, they're there on the phone and you can call them up and say, look, Daniel's put me under this drug, I need more of it and, and everything's easy, okay? So, um, just to give you a bit of a background, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Basically, initial consultations take quite a while, okay? Um, and we may just um, uh, spend, say, about 40% of the work is actually just getting history from you guys, okay? As I said, not everyone wants to get everything perfect, but most of the time people want a diagnosis. Some people don't, they just want things fixed. So, especially in the context of allergy, a lot of the time we'll, the client will come in and, you know, the dog will have chronic allergies. Sometimes the skin's already been damaged to the point that working out the cause of the allergy is not um, so important. But most of the time, especially when we've got healthy skin, getting a diagnosis is important. Um, so history, as I said, is very, very important. We talk especially with context of allergies, which is what tonight's all about. We take a fair bit of time just going through all of these things here. You know, what when did it start? You know, where do you live? What sort of house? Are you living in a weatherboard house, a brick house? Is it old is it new is there propensity for mold to build up is there dust if you've got carpets indoor outdoor what's made it better what's worst uh, you know what's made it worse um, we talk about itching level and that's a really important thing to communicate on okay um, the reason we we need to i guess understand about itch level is because if we can agree together or you and your partner can agree together um, on how itchy your dog is when it comes to allergies. It helps us to choose medications that are going to be suitable, at least at the start of the therapy. And it also tells us about the disease. Certain diseases are going to be very distinctly, very, very itchy. Some are going to be mild. And often there's combinations of diseases. Um, but with regard to um, tailoring your treatment, by knowing sort of a quantifiable level of itch, um, that we can both communicate very clearly on. We can then tell whether you're getting improvement, okay? So this is the sort of thing I'm talking about. We call this a, the pruritus visual analog scale uh, in veterinary terms. Um, basically, we've got everything from very, very severe itch that's basically uninterruptible, even when the animal's eating, 
um, down to a normal dog, and we call a normal dog basically anywhere between zero and two out of 10. Um, and that's something at your first visit for allergies that you need to have down pat as a communication tool because everybody's interpretation of their animal's itch is going to be very different, okay? especially when it's in the middle of the night. They're itching in the middle of the night. Most people say the itching is very severe uh, if they're putting up with that every day. Um, you know, so the initial consultation, we do an examination. I usually take some photographs, especially if they're really marked um, lesions, um, document everything. We use some tools every now and then. We use these canine ATP um, extent and severity index tools. Um, they can be useful. I'll just explain that briefly. A couple of tools we use, we use that one. We might use one called a Cadley. It's a bit like going to a psychologist, they'll usually score you. Sometimes we use these tools to, to get a picture of severity and classify you. So everything we do is evidence-based. So, you know, there's all, all these journals. These are wonderful journals, you know, and it's good bedtime reading, but really they are great. There's, there's usually you know, new things coming out all the time, new techniques, new tools we can use. Uh, a few Australians, thankfully, um, that are putting some really good um, research into some of this work. So Peter Hill, for example, he's in Adelaide. Uh, so the Aussies actually have a pretty good contribution to research, and I'm doing a bit of that myself as well. Um, so this is um, the Cadizi tool. You know, you can see there's obviously varying uh, degrees of severity here. You don't have to uh, have be looking at the, the writing on the side to know where the severity is. But these are sort of variations we're dealing with every day. You know, I'm pro off, 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 often presented with these sort of feet. People say to me, you know, how can I fix my dog's feet? So you can see there's some big problems here that we've got to deal with that are just not just the allergies. We've got to sort of start to work on these skin barrier issues. Okay. Uh, control infection, skin barriers, um, control the allergy itself. This is um, again the Cadizi. So we look at all of these sites, okay? And these are sites that we're looking at all the time when you when you come in, and you will have seen these sites on your dogs uh, if they're allergic, and and dermatologists always looking out for these sites. They're just givens. This is where you find the lesions, okay? So we can classify them. We can say they're mild, moderate, severe, and so on. Again, another one, this is a, a simplified version, which is actually probably easy to use if people want to use it, vets want to use it. Um, this was sort of an updated, uh, newer way to classify severity. Okay, so you get the basic idea of it. With allergy, basically, we're looking at the head, the ear flaps, which we call the pinnae, the front feet, the hind feet, the lower um, chest and, and uh, abdomen and armpits. Uh, and I'll explain a few distinct features between food allergy and ATP. It'll help you to understand um, how we pick those apart with some of these small hints here. So when you're there, you think, God, why well, I'm at the vet so long, this is taking forever. My initial visits I book out, as I said, one and a half to two hours. Coronavirus has made things a little bit more challenging again because um, we don't have you in the room. So there's a lot of communication over the phone. I bought these earbuds recently for this purpose because it means I can work hands-free and I can talk to you at the same time. Um, so you're sort of in the room as I'm going over your animal, which I think makes things really a lot easier. We do a lot of microscopy, of course, collect samples while you're there. I try and do everything in one fell swoop, uh, apart from anything external I have to send away. So that basically we get to the end of the visit, unless there's external laboratory tests to do, you walk away with um, a full report that has um, the examination, the history on it, basically a list, list of possible diagnoses um, and the plan going forward, okay? And often I'll send you photographs during the session as well so you know what's going on. So we formulate our differential diagnoses, as we call them, which are the, the, the likely diagnoses causing the problem. And then we've got all these other issues to manage, okay? So infection to control, barrier to, to manage, the skin to restore. You know, your outcomes, your expectations, often we've got to mull over that in the session as well, talk about costs, which is what you always do when you're in vet. Um, okay, and what can you manage? You know, is it logistically possible? There's no good in me sending you home with something that's not possible to do. And then we talk about, you know, where are we going to go? What's the plan? How are we going to catch up um, down the track and manage this? Um, all of the treatments that we should be doing and always are doing in referral level medicine or dermatology or surgery is scientific, okay? And it should all be based on evidence, okay? It's, 
these aren't the only journals I read, but as I say, you know, we should be looking at papers all the time. We should be understanding the stats, the bare bones, figures about you know, what's driving a problem, why is it happening, what's the likelihood of this treatment working, okay? So I get a lot of posts on social media that that I, I seem to ask to get roped into um, posts about allergic disease or a certain drug. Not so long ago, there was a, a drug that came up on a particular Facebook page that clients, pet owners, were, were really hard up against this drug and they wanted me to come in. And I, I deliberately stayed out of the argument, but I'm all for evidence-based arguments. And, and if there's no evidence to support someone's argument, well, let's let's dig some up, you know, and, and at least let's talk about it in an educated manner. So that's what I like to do here. Nothing I do, I'm going to do is, is going to be made, um, I guess, based on witchcraft, okay? And we'll, we'll also talk about, you know, the concept of management versus cure. Um, sometimes in, in, in the process of getting a cure, for example, immunotherapy, if, you, if we went through immunotherapy to desensitise your dog to allergies, well, we'll have to manage the case up until that point. Some of the cases when I see them are beyond getting any benefit from, say, immunotherapy or, or um, desensitisation to their allergies, and we just have to manage them. It's the only place to go, okay? All right, obviously we send you home with some medications, we plan to follow up and off we go. So coming up for air, this was um, two years ago, um, my weekend um, I spent up in Slovakia, so the northern Slovakia, the border of Poland, um, and I just went mountaineering for, for three days. Um, uh, took the Monday out of the course um, and um, went up here camping for the weekend, which was great. Um, when I left the car park, there was a big bear uh, fiberglass dummy, and I just assumed the fiberglass dummy was a bit like what you'd see at Yellowstone Park. It was just there for the tourists to look at. Um, I didn't think I'd see bears out here, but um, in the night, walking back down through this valley, <laughs> I saw three bears. So that was quite quite scary, and uh, maybe I should have had my bear spray with me. Right, so we work on all these different areas, trying to get the skin sorted out with allergies. Allergies are a long-term discipline. You know, we don't get results quickly, and that's dermatology by and large. So as I said, follow-up support's important. I had a lady today from Horsham, for example, who saw her dog last week, and we just did a phone follow-up. And that's got her on track. We spent about half an hour on the phone, but that makes life easy. It means we can do things remotely very easily. Okay, so just going back, um, I'll just wish you through, I guess, through um, what really causes um, itching in dogs and cats. Okay, so this is the crux of what you'll, um, I guess, be going through. You may not get exposed to it when you go you see a dermatologist, but this is exactly what they're working through. Um, it, it's important you guys can understand this. Okay. So the good news is, Everything that's going to make a dog itch is on this page, okay? And if anyone's got any other um, uh, ideas on what makes animals itch, I'd be really rapt to, to see you put your hand up and just present them. Um, there's going to be some things like psychogenic problems, for example, like a granuloma that might be caused by a psychosis, and that is the case. Those do occur. But as far as allergic skin disease goes and itch broadly, these are the only causes. So if you just kind of blank out the right side of the screen, just forget all that stuff there. When it comes down to working out whether your dog's got allergies, when you come in to see me, this is what we're going to work through is just this right-hand side, okay? If you come in and tell me that my dog's already on Revector or some of the great flea treatments, well, we're not going to assume those things are not there, but it's going to take the likelihood of these two top things, scabies and um, flea allergy. It's going to take those largely out of the picture. We'll still look for them, of course. But really, most cases of allergy come down to once you've ruled out those simple things at the top, we're trying to distinguish either between food or between environmental allergy. Okay. Now, most animals don't come in with squeaky clean skin. Okay. The secondary causes of itching, so these come later on basically after primary cause has already let the immune system down. These secondary causes are often what your primary vet, your general practice vet will, will probably call the, the main problem, okay? 
and they'll be fighting with these problems all the time. They'll be wrestling with bacterial infection, they'll be wrestling with yeast infections. And some of these animals that go to the vet all the time are, are going in for courses of antibiotics or courses of antiseptic treatments pretty regularly, okay? And what we're dealing with on those cases is we're dealing with these secondary infections, but we're forgetting about the primary cause, okay? Or we don't have the tools or the understanding to deal with the primary cause. So if we can control this primary cause over here on the left, all the primary causes, as long as the skin is not permanently damaged, and we don't have those chronic changes that we've got to manage. Dealing with the primary cause will often actually stop all those secondary causes from coming back. Okay, so life can be a lot easier if we just go straight to the source, manage the primary cause. Okay. So all of these causes on this page are going to, to release when the, the skin surface cells, the keratinocytes as we call them, get damaged or they get injured they're going to release a certain type of chemical we call interleukin-31. Okay, it's released from the skin cells. It goes through the bloodstream and when it reaches the brain, it triggers off a reflex of itching. Okay. Now, um, each of these um, components uh, which will cause release of that uh, chemical are going to add to more and more chemical being released, okay, more and more interleukin-31 or interleukin-4 as well and some other cytokines that are chemical messengers. Now what I'm getting at here is that if you come in with a dog that's got infection with yeast, with bacteria, um, it's got dry skin, it suffers from anxiety and this is not an uncommon picture. Anxiety itself is going to release interleukins, okay. You've got all of those causes you've got to deal with that are releasing the interleukins. Then you've got your, your food allergy, your ATP that's also driving it. So you've got this massive storm of cytokines that is going to be needing to be controlled. Okay. So what we need to do is control each of those components. And by doing so, we bring down the itching. Okay. And ultimately, the idea is if you're open to it, is what we do is we control, once we know what it is, the main cause and the primary cause, and then everything settles down. And everybody's happy. I'm just gonna take a sip. So probably everybody's uh, familiar with ATP, as we call it. Um, it's genetically um, uh, predisposed in certain dogs, certain breeds. Um, in dogs, we certainly know six months to three years of age is sort of the ages that we're looking at. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about cats. and You guys aren't here to talk about cats. Rarely do we see allergy uh, coming on after seven years of age with ATP. Okay, it's a it's a young dog condition. Um, it can be seasonal, non-seasonal. Um, seasonal, as you know, is classically you dry a month of the year. That's when your, your grasses, trees, weeds are going to pollinate. Um, we sort of get non-seasonal ATP, which is um, going to be continuous and that's dogs that are inside the house uh, predominantly and a lot of dogs you know spend 90 percent 90 percent of the time indoors um, house dust mite um, is a huge problem and that's the most um, common driver for atopic dermatitis especially when we skin test dogs and then there's you know dogs just um, that have a myriad of allergies will find um, some dogs like skin test for example have grass allergies they'll have allergies to trees Allergies to moulds, allergies to insects, and you think, oh, this poor creature. Um, but the good news is dogs that have a lot of allergies respond very, very well to um, immunotherapy. So let's not get too carried away with too much of the detail. Um, but basically, um, the critical thing to take note of here, what I want you guys to take home after this um, session is basically some of the bell ringers that you might work out a distinct features that will help you to tell ATP from food allergy okay by and large ATP and food allergy are very difficult to tell apart um, apart from seasonality seasonality is a huge thing so the problem seasonal well, that obviously makes you think well maybe we're dealing more with with um, ATP than food food is going to be there all the time when it comes to the lesions and where to look for lesions you know we talk about this concave ear flap that's a huge um, focus for atopic dermatitis, okay? Um, 
apart from that, you know, things like sneezing, conjunctivitis, there's certainly food allergy problems, um, uh, sorry, environmental allergy problems. Um, when we're looking at um, ATP, certainly you're going to look at hairless areas, you know, armpits, groin, abdomen, they're going to be really prominent spots that we're going to look for um, signs of ATP. Hope everybody's still with me. Um, all right. So please don't take offence to this. This is not my words. This is um, from our Bible of dermatology. These are the breeds that we know we see a lot of ATP in, okay? And the base population is basically compared to um, other breeds um, have a huge propensity to getting ATP, okay? And there's a, a, a great deal more dogs on the, on the uh, spectrum for ATP than, than what are on this list, okay? and closely related genetic breeds um, will we'll also get ATP at higher numbers than the average dog. Certainly we don't see a lot of Kelpies, for example, with ATP. So this is sort of a test panel we use for um, when we're doing a test um, kit. This is my kit that I've devised for Victoria based on um, plants we tend to come across mostly as allergens in Victoria, in at least southern Victoria. I've got another one I use for the Murray River area and also Tasmania has got a slightly different panel as well. But Southern uh, mainland Australia, this is sort of what we're testing. So it's always gonna be trees, grasses, weeds, molds, insects. Um, and a lot of these plants will actually have, um, for example, uh, a number of cross reactors. So for example, Bermuda grass will actually cover you. If you test for Bermuda grass, which is what we're doing here, there's four other grasses in there that are going to actually be um, uh, tested by just testing Bermuda grass, okay? So there's a great deal more um, uh, allergens that we're testing for by testing these key ones, which we have what we call cross-reactivity for a great deal more plants that are in the environment, okay? So you've only got, say, 60 allergens here we're testing for. Well, there's probably about 150 allergens actually that are gonna pop up as um, reactors uh, when we run this test panel. So these are sort of regions that we're talking about with allergy and everybody's seen them, you know, muscle, face, feet, ears, around the eyes, and classic areas for ATP, but also unfortunately classic areas for food allergy. Okay. And uh, you've got to be able to tell them apart. That's the, that's the tricky part. There's two areas that um, are really distinctive um, as far as ATP goes. Um, one, of the, one of the key things with ATP that you'll notice is the ear flaps are what we call lichenified or they've become woody. That's really what lichenified means in its true sense. But can you see here this scarring and folding you're seeing on this ear flap, okay? Compare it to a normal healthy ear that will have perfectly smooth skin. Well, this corrugation you're seeing here is chronic scarring, and that's basically, it's partly going to be due to secondary infection that's colonised that area, but really in a non-infected ear, that scarring and changes come about through exposure of the skin to allergen that's constantly landing on that skin, and the skin's red and inflamed. And if the skin stays red and inflamed for long enough over you know, huge periods of time, then you're going to get scarring going on. That's what's going on in this, with this ear here. It's, it's basically scarred and this is remodeled. And that ear may never be the same again. But the minute I see that ear in practice, I can tell you, well, your dog has ATP. I know that. He might have food allergy as well, but ATP is certainly part of your problem. Okay. The other thing is food allergy tends to manifest quite differently. Okay. So... Dogs with food allergy alone, the, the actual um, inflammation of the ear canal is centered upon the opening of the ear canal, okay? And maybe you won't even see inflammation there, but certainly when we look down those ears, we're gonna have inflammation of the horizontal and the vertical ear canal. So we put the scope straight down, the vertical ear canal is gonna be inflamed, and certainly the horizontal ear canal, as we tend closer towards the eardrum, is gonna be inflamed in those dogs. So we're always gonna look down the ear to to pick up their indices of suspicion for food allergy because they're going to be there. And some dogs just come in with advanced ear infections, but certainly when we catch them early, we can often make a distinction. So 
but just to lighten things up, this is um, the training facility in the basement of um, the University of Vienna where the vet students do their training. Um, this is uh, the sort of model that they have a number of um, all around the place in this basement. They've got tails that they can inject into and, and take blood from. They've got horses they can pull apart. They can get inside this horse's stomach. Um, here they're doing able to do uh, desexing procedures on mannequins, which is uh, pretty cool. They can do dentals on cadavers. Uh, they're doing ultrasounds, uh, running anaesthetics, um, putting IV fluids in, this sort of stuff. This is stuff that Melbourne University are working towards doing, not based on the University of Vienna, but this is kind of like the world standard. This is how we should be teaching our students. And these guys can come in, these students can come in after hours and use this stuff any time, which is pretty awesome because it means they're graduating with a much higher skill set than a lot of other university students will be. I was really impressed with this. So there's a great deal of items that have caused food allergy and this is all documented. This is, if you want references on any of this material, I've got it all. So if you look through the list there, you can see basically there's nothing really that hasn't been documented as a cause of food allergy. And just about everything you can think of is here. Even some of the better known brands of dog food, you know, they're, they're quite common in uh, incriminate, uh, incriminated products. So there are all things we need to be mindful of when we've got um, a food allergies or where do we start? It's such a huge, huge problem. All the commercial dog foods have been incriminated as drivers for food allergy. It doesn't mean that commercial dog foods are bad. It's just the reason we're getting food allergies to those products is that's because what most people food feed, feed their animals. If you were to feed your animal rabbit or beef all the time, or well, repeated exposure is going to mean that you're going to get food allergy potentially in your animal because they're predisposed to being allergic to those products. Okay. I'm going to explain to you how food allergy develops and that will sort of explain some of the reasoning behind why these things show up repeatedly as well. So basically, um, when the gut's developing, um, it um, needs to be able to tolerate um, foreign antigens, okay? And it needs to be a good seal, okay? The gut's, gut's basically designed to be a good seal so that the things that belong in the body and need to get into the body can get in, so nutrient wants to get through. But the mucus, the cells, the lining, the small um, villi, which are the um, very small um, hairs throughout the gut, basically designed to filter things out. Okay. Now, sometimes we get damage to the gut or an abnormally formed gut, and that will predispose the animal or the human to getting uh, food allergies later in life. Okay. Sometimes we're getting huge amounts of antibiotics, for example, used in puppies. And I try, really try to avoid, and I try and talk all the vets out of using antibiotics in puppies, but that can be a real driver. Inflammatory bowel disease, those kind of things, big problems for propensity for food allergies and celiac disease and that kind of thing in humans, gluten intolerance, this kind of stuff. Are you there, Mark? Yep. Are there questions popping up that I'm not seeing? There are some questions. Um... We've very recently had one that asked for your thoughts on cytopoint injections. Yes. Um, a question that was that just said demodectic maimed from Eva, okay. asking where it fits into it. Um, okay, surely. Yeah. A, a couple that have arisen, but I think you've addressed in terms of grass allergy and uh, spring effects being very yep. seasonal as we are. I think that's all that are um, related to dermatology. Oh, and somebody else is asking here just now, um, the impact of antibiotics given to the dam when for say mastitis and what impact that has on pups. Sure, okay, um, good. Is that enough to keep okay. you going? There's a couple more now yeah, we yeah, open sure. the floodgates. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we might save some of these for, um, we might uh, put them in a bit of a queue for the yep. end. 
some yep. of them I think that, that fit into the context of what we're talking about right away are important to maybe check off now. Yep. Um, antibiotics in the dam, um, there, there would be um, research um, papers that tell us a little bit more about how it affects the puppies. From a dermatologic perspective, from what I know and what I've read, there's not a lot published about the flow on effects of giving the dam antibiotics and how that's actually going to affect the puppies and certainly that's an area that needs more work. I think the challenge you've got with that is that with all these studies to have a powerful study, we need big sample sizes, okay, and we need the right participants. So the evidence in that area is somewhat lacking. We don't know a lot about it. When we go back to talking about, I'm just going to scroll back through these a little bit. We go back to talking about the possible causes here. Somebody mentioned demodectic mange. How does that fit into itching? Well, scabies, which is obviously a human um, pathogen as well, psychopic, um, psychopic scabii. You know, it's an STD in humans. It causes a lot of itch. Okay, demodectic mange is not an itchy disease. Okay, demodex you'll see in puppies. It's not an itchy condition. And the adult dog, it causes hair loss and it often comes in when we've got immunosuppression for some other reason, but it will not cause itching, okay? I hopefully that answers the question that was um, kind of put up. So just to go forward again, um, basically the crux of what we're getting when we've got um, a food allergy is the reason it comes about, we think, is because the gut's leaky, damaged, we've got reduced immunity in the gut. Sometimes we don't know, most of the time, I mean, the food allergy dogs that I come across, ultimately, the damage has already been done by the time we see those animals, okay? We get intolerance, we get antibodies produced. They're the same type of antibody that are produced in atopy, okay? We call it IgE. Now, when the, um, the body comes across those allergens, again, that are ingested or they're inhaled, as a food allergy, that's when we're going to get more and more of this IgE produced recurrently with every exposure. So the responses to the, the allergens, which is in the food, are going to be exacerbated more and more over time to the point that some animals will actually get anaphylaxis, a bit like a peanut reaction that you might see with somebody you know, that's inhaled the dust of the peanut on an aeroplane. So the way it works is the antibody doesn't cause the effects on its own. Basically, it does is cross bridges, um, binding sites on inflammatory cells and cause a release of histamines and other inflammatory mediators. And that's where you get these massive um, cascades of itching and so on. Okay. <clears throat> so there's basically most of what we're seeing is allergic reactions, what we call type one to four hypersensitivity reactions. Okay, so the bee sting type reactions and a couple of delayed type reactions. Humans, certainly we know it's type 1, which is what we call that immediate insect bite type reaction, okay? And there's all these other types too of other processes that are going to cause reactions to food allergies. We don't call them true allergic reactions, but we call them sort of adverse reactions, which are a big part of um, understanding your animal's food allergy when you go to the dermatologist. And they will explain some of the germ signs, but most of the dermatology signs are going to be caused by true allergy reactions, okay? <clears throat> um, something I'd just like to maybe get you to take note of, Mark, too, is that if, if anybody in this presentation is just not understanding something I've just said, some of this stuff I'm going to whiz through because it's getting quite scientific at this point. If you're not understanding it and you think everyone else needs to know about this, just put your hand up and please tell Mark to stop me and, and we'll stop there and then I'll go through it, okay? I, I am, in fact, <laughs> sort of following the chats fairly um, consistently so if you want to communicate through that um, feel free I can't, actually just... see, I can't actually see it so you can't um... see the chats because you're sharing your screen but I'm keeping tabs on it I've made some okay. notes and I can scroll back and forwards all right hopefully everybody's still awake anyway I've still got you your attention um, so not everybody's a scientist and not everybody needs to be. Some of this stuff's pretty heavy. Um, basically, we, we measure, measure the size of proteins in, in kilodaltons or daltons. Kilodaltons is thousands of daltons. We know that allergens that are very small, um, 
or any protein that's very small gets so small that the immune system can't pick it up, okay? In the gut, we're talking about um, gut lymphatics that pick up the allergens. In the skin, where we're talking about ATP and skin exposure to allergens. We're talking about these dendritic cells that are part of the, um, the immune system. And what they do is they, they reach out into the skin surface, a bit like an octopus, and they draw all these um, allergens down from the surface and deliver them to the immune system. Okay. So most of the allergens we're seeing are big. Okay, we're talking, you know, 50 to 60 um, kilodaltons. The, the smallest allergen we know of that actually elicited an immune response was, you know, in the order of about 27 kilodaltons. Okay. Um, there are some impurities in some of the hydrolyzed um, diets, which are these hydrolyzed diets. I'll explain to you in a, a little bit down the track, but these processed foods that are designed to be um, low allergen foods, and they'll process them and make all the proteins very small, but then they'll leave ingredients in there that on their own are actually well known to be um, allergenic. Okay, so starch is a big problem. Rice, for example, big problem. So obviously food's going to affect a great deal of body systems, you know. Um, it can cause um, neurological conditions, urologic conditions, respiratory conditions. But the main thing we focus on as dermatologists is going to be skin disease, obviously. Uh, closely tied to that is gut disease, okay? And a huge hint that we get when we've got a dog that's got skin disease coming in that's itchy. We need to make that distinction between the last two things on our list. We go right back through that. You know, talk about this list of possibilities, okay? When we're working through this list here to work out our underlying causes, trying to distinguish between these two, we need all the hints we can get, okay? Now, the diagnosis of ATP, the reason, the, the way we get to this diagnosis of ATP is basically by ruling all of these other things out. So there's no positive test we have for ATP, okay? We can test your dog for what it's allergic to once we know it's atopic. But if we do that off the bat, we're going to get a lot of false positives. Okay. So the first thing we do is we need to rule in food allergy. Okay. If we rule in food allergy, we're happy. We've got a food allergic dog class. Life's wonderful. If we rule out food allergy early on, your dog by default, the only other thing left in the room here that's causing itching, once you've got skin that's in good condition, is going to be ATP. Okay. So we're always looking for hints that are going to drive us closer to thinking, well, what? Could this dog have as a clinical sign that's going to make me think it might be food allergic? Okay, let's go forward here again. So, there are certain breeds again, please don't take this personally, anybody, but we know there are certain breeds that we see more likely to have food allergies. Okay, and allergies by and large, um, I've seen a good number of boxes that have very profound allergic responses. Um, even to things like mosquito bites and insect bites. I'm not sure why it is we've seen so many boxes. Um, last summer, I've never seen so many boxes with feasting allergies. That was really um, quite an amazing season for it. Obviously, German Shepherds, we see a lot of allergy in um, food allergy as well. Different studies will tell you different things, but basically these breeds tend to pop up in most of the studies that relate to food allergy. <clears throat> so basically, food allergy is going to look a lot like ATP. Okay? Any age, any breed, though, however. Okay? Whereas you may remember we talked about ATP. ATP is going to be presenting anywhere between about six months and three years of age, which interestingly is the same age of onset as epilepsy. Okay? Um, so the age of onset with food allergy is, is basically going to be any age, and often it starts very young in life. <laughs> Okay, so if I've got a dog that come in, comes in at three, three months, <coughs> Marg won't have this problem with her dogs because she, she feeds uh, no processed foods to her dogs. <coughs> That's right, isn't it, Marg? You're not, yep, not into yep. processed foods? No, no. Been learnt the lesson long ago. And in fact, yeah. my boxes were always good on skin but terrible on the bee stings. You're right, it was a rite of passage that a boxer puppy would get some almighty bee sting as a youngster. Yeah, it's interesting too, this, I don't think it's very well understood, but you know, boxes are predisposed genetically to mast cell tumors. Mast cell tumors make a lot of histamine. 
Um, histamine is responsible for the type 1 hypersensitivity response that um, is driven by the insect bite that comes from the bee. And I've always sort of questioned whether um, there's some, something in the box that makes them super sensitive to bee sting reactions, because we see a lot of them that for that. Um, so food allergy, basically, it's non-seasonal, any age, any breed. You need tiny amounts of protein um, to cause a reaction. And that's, I'll talk to you about the significance of that when it comes down to doing food allergies. Now we're talking milligrams in a lot of these cases. Sensitization is required, which means that the animals need prior exposure to these foods, which don't have to be packaged foods. For example, you could feed your dog turkey meat for its entire upbringing. It wouldn't be a balanced diet, but that animal would be then more likely, if it's going to develop an allergy, to develop an allergy to what it's been fed recurrently. Okay, so a lot of repetitive exposure is required to develop these allergies in many of the cases. And you've got the gut changes that are there as the foundation. So the, we think the gut changes are the, the primer for food allergies and then the recurrent exposure is what develops the, the responses that you get in these exacerbated responses to the allergies once they've leaked through into the immune system through that leaky gut. Okay. <clears throat> so just be mindful that when you go to your, your dermatologist to talk about food allergies, basically there's this distinction that has to be made between food allergy and ATP. Okay. And the areas affected basically are going to a, um, reflective in a lot of dogs for food allergy, for flea allergy, for ATP, and even for scabies. Okay. So this distinction is not super straightforward. Okay. But it's easy to make the distinction if we do things systematically. So sort of uh, real bell ringers, you know, chronic year-round itching. The animals look atopic. Often ATV and flea and, and food allergy will occur together. Okay. A big part of um, ATV and food allergy that we need to be clear on is the ear changes. Okay. Often they'll start with ear infections, especially food allergic dogs. About three quarters of those dogs are going to come in with ear infections as their first problem. You know, I get a lot of puppies coming in that are maybe six months old. And I look back through the clinical notes from their vet and they, they came in at 10 weeks old with the first ear infection. And I say, well, given the number of uh, food allergic dogs that start with an ear infection, we've got to put that pretty high on the index of suspicion for a food allergy. That dog, if it comes in with that sort of history. Okay. Um, gastrointestinal signs and ears are the really big um, bell ringers for a food allergy. Okay. We'll talk more about that. So basically, we need a really thorough workup. We have to take all that basic stuff away, all the, the simple things like scabies, flea allergy. Take those out of the picture early on before you start to make this distinction. Okay. So the reason I've put this slide up again, you've already seen this slide. Basically, this slide is exactly the same as the slide we have for ATP because the, the regions affected are going to be very similar almost the same clinical picture. So the gut signs, <clears throat> there's certain surveys I could have put up in, in this uh, PowerPoint presentation that are uh, very well-documented studies that tell us the number of poos a dog should have each day, the, the average healthy dog, um, how frequent they'll fart, um, whether it's common to have an itchy bottom, how commonly uh, it is for dogs to eat grass, um, whether they get tummy rumbles, what the stool should look like for the average dog. Okay, Obviously, diet is going to play a role in influencing some of these things. The thing we do know is that dogs that have three or more poos per day have a high likelihood of having a food allergy. Okay, And that's one of the key things when I'm collecting in history that we need to go through is gastrointestinal signs form that you know, 15, 20 percent of the information I need to collect because that's really important information to help with some of this distinction. So if you come into me and you say, look, my dog's, my dog has four poos a day. I say, wow, has it always done that? Yeah, he was on this food, he did it. He's on this food, we did it. Oh, we changed this other brand of food. He stopped having so many shits each day. He's doing less. 
And that's the, that's really important information. Okay. <clears throat> when we're doing feeding trials and diet trials to, to rule in food allergy, these are sort of things that are going to change during those times. So we're going to be looking for changes in consistency of the poo, reduced vomiting, less farting. Uh, I'll have animals in the consultation room that are basically fart so much you've got to clear the room when you're in there. And uh, I'm in there for dermatology uh, consultation with them. And, and their real bell ring is for me. You know, I think, wow, this talks farting a lot. Yes, they might be on cheap dog food that's full of fat, but still you've got to be suspicious, especially when you're getting that many stools each day and a lot of gas, a lot of tummy rumbles, that kind of stuff. Okay. So the proteins that we know are responsible, certainly we do know that these are the core proteins um, based on um, a good number of studies. So you can see this first study is in 33 dogs, okay, one of the, the best known studies beef, dairy and wheat, big problems, okay? And this isn't dogs that are fed packaged food. This is dogs that are fed a myriad of different products, whether they're home cooked, packaged um, and, and sourced from places that are not your vet or your supermarket or your, your pet shop. There's a lot of stuff we don't know, okay? We don't know the exact incidence, but certainly beef, dairy, chicken, massive problems. Dogs are actually problematic with fish as well. Okay, a lot of commercial dog foods have fish in them. So repetitive exposure to those substances, especially when they start early in life, are going to be ongoing drivers for food allergies later on. Um, preservatives are often incriminated in the human world and in the animal world for being drivers of food allergies. There's not a lot of um, evidence in um, animals to say that preservatives are a huge problem. Um, I tend to try to test for them during a, a feeding trial. However, I include that as part of the, the elimination. Um, I'll explain how that process works. So the reality is there's going to be such a long list. You know, humans in Australia culturally I think are lazy. And this is what the Europeans tell us. We've got European dermatologists come to Australia and Australians don't like to follow rules so much as maybe some of the Europeans might. This is a real generalisation that you may not like to hear, but I think there is some truth in it. You know, we're very busy people. We tend to not do as much cooking as we might have done in previous generations, our parents and our grandparents did. So these days, getting people to do a feeding trial can be pretty hard. Okay. So one feeding trial tends to be about as many feeding trials as we tend to do in Australia, whereas some of the other cultures like Europe, for example, they do a lot more home cooking. They're happy to do one, two, three feeding trials. Okay. And not just a feeding trial, but what we call the re-challenge, which is after we've, we've put the animal on a certain food, we've seen improvement. We're not relying on our medication to control itching. What we do then is if the animal's not itching and it's on the right the prescription diet or the packaged food we're feeding as the, the control diet, if you like, that doesn't contain the allergens, we'll re-challenge them with their old food and we'll re-challenge them with foods that we think they might react to. Well, those re-challenges, you could do half a dozen or 10 or 12. By picking the right ingredients to do as a priority list rather than doing all of the ingredients that could be in the world that could be affecting your dog. By just picking off, say, half a dozen things to work through initially, you usually find one or two allergens that are going to be incriminating um, uh, in your food allergy problem. So just to make you guys um, mindful of um, sort of the, the numbers we're looking at that we know drive um, itching in dogs, about three quarters of the dogs we're going to see that are itchy who come into a vet clinic are going to be atopic, okay? And and maybe maybe three out of 10 of those um, dogs are gonna be a food allergic, okay? Similar sort of um, information to what I presented earlier. So the important thing is um, that the food allergic dogs, nearly half of them are gonna have gastrointestinal signs that go along with their food allergy that's driving their skin disease. And that's that important bell ringer I talked about earlier.
how do you tell them apart? Okay, so this is just a bit of a recap. ATP, you remember we said six months to three years of age, general onset, food allergy, usually early onset, especially under six months. If it's under six months, we've got to say, hold on, this, we've got to really pursue food allergy here. Okay, ATP is going to be mostly seasonal, can be winter. Animals that are inside more, for example, that have a food allergy, uh, sorry, that have an allergy to uh, dust mites, are going to be more reactive in winter. So they're sort of out of season A to B dogs, if you like. They're not classic dry season allergies. They're, they're wintertime allergies. And I've just gone through a run of these uh, dogs recently. We've had a run of them being winter. You know, people coming in, they're saying the dog's allergies have gotten worse. And you skin test them, they come up positive for house dust mite. Um, the food allergy distribution is going to be varied, um, but it's going to be somewhat similar to ATP. Um, again, the ears, we talked about comparing ear flaps to ear canals. Okay, so ATP is going to affect your ear flaps as a real problem. Those lichenified, thickened ear flaps, classics for ATP. And with food allergy, it's going to be the openings of the ears and the vertical ear canal and the horizontal ear canal, which you guys won't be able to see um, externally, but certainly. Your vet, your dermatologist should be looking down all those ears. Any itchy dog that's that's not getting its ears scoped is missing out on some really important information to contribute to the clinical picture. Okay, and obviously, ATP generally doesn't have any gastrointestinal signs that are part of the history that that could could be related. Okay, you're not going to get GI signs with an ATP dog, but you certainly will in about fifty percent of your food allergy dogs. So here we go, here's a research cow. She doesn't get much sun these days. The guys get to remove the side here and uh, get into her stomach and uh, play around with all the four stomachs of the cow and probably do some, some mock surgery when they get to milk her and see if she's got mastitis. This is, is a, again in the basement of the uh, vet school. Bit of a laugh, it's quite fun. Big place. How's everybody going? Are we uh, going okay? We've had a few more questions in, but we'll work through them and I'll try to be good and go back okay. and be systematic about it. Anything that's pertinent for the moment? Uh, no, you've touched on some of the issues, but um, nothing, nothing huge at this stage. Okay. All right. I'll press on. Okay. Um, so when we're collecting a history, you know, for a food allergy um, uh, case, um, we've got to, you know, talk about um, some other um, challenges that we've got to manage, you know. Um, we talk about doing feeding trials for animals. Um, we're going to put your animal on prescription foods. I'm just going to quickly recap this here, yeah. I guess so the only... The only point I would make, Dan, is that we're at nine o'clock and, and we need to think where we want to be in terms of a few questions, but there's not a huge number of questions. And as you yeah. say, we can perhaps follow those up later. Yeah, sure. No, I'll, I'll try and march them on a bit. Um, when I've got to work out, you guys, a, a plan for, um, for doing elimination diet trials, basically, we've got to think, well, um, if you've got multiple pets in the household, you're going to put you on a prescription diet or a packaged food of some sort. Some of the challenges fall in when you have multiple pets at home. If you've got multiple pets, they're all going to drink from the same water source. So elimination diet trials in a house with multiple pets becomes a logistical challenge. Okay? All the animals have to be on the same food if you want to be a purist because there's going to be basically sharing of allergens of those milligrams of allergens through the water source so it's no good in putting one dog in the household of five dogs on an elimination diet trial if they all share water or if they all steal food or if there are kids in the house or grandparents in the house that feed the dogs when you're not home okay food, food feed trials have to be done very strictly okay there's a way to reduce some of these confounding errors and and little bumps along the road that might pop up and that's to keep the feeding trial short. And we've got some more recent trial techniques that are used now that can shorten your feeding trial to about a month rather than being 10 to 12 weeks. Okay. 
when someone comes to me with a history um uh, to talk about um you know allergies um, they'll start telling me about their diet and really all i really want to know is um just a few words um what i mean uh, by this statement is that all the commercial packaged foods are basically the same when we're talking about food allergies um a lot of the common ingredients that you'll have in your packaged foods are going to be common across different brands of foods okay and i'll explain why uh, as you know when when a pet, pet food manufacturer makes a particular product of food they need to meet certain benchmarks okay they need to meet to for example fall into a premium bracket of food like your hills your royal cannon your irons your you can um, uh, advanced food for example they need to have benchmarks for protein for carbs for fats and they also need to have um, uh, set levels of analysis on their foods okay the challenge is though that to make their products economically they put most of the products will go through the same production line or, or use a number of production lines that have different lines of food on them so so for example you'll buy a chicken and a chicken and uh, vegetable food that's packaged and marked as optimum well in the morning they might have run chicken and veg through but in the evening they'll run beef and uh, beef and pasta through who knows okay so you'll have a label that will tell you it'll be chicken and veg but um, in reality it's probably got trace of beef and pasta on it okay Quality assurance isn't quite up there with um, what we'd expect in the human world. There's a lot of variables. So instead of when we start a, 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 an elimination diet trial, uh, instead of saying, well, what could it be in my dog's food that's causing the problem? And going through the ingredients and trying each of those ingredients to see whether we get a response. A simpler approach is to say, let's take all of the allergens away from the diet take everything out that could be reactive and you think how can i do this well I'll explain it take everything out and let's see how your dog does without all of those allergens you take everything out okay that's really the approach you need to do here <clears throat> so how do you do it how do you make those allergens how do you take them out of the diet make nothing reactive we either make them unrecognizable so those proteins that could be reactive we treat and protein hydrolysis is basically the chemical or the heat treatment of proteins to make them smaller so the immune system can't pick them up okay um, so some of the foods you've probably heard of a food for example called say royal cannon hypoallergenic or anallergenic or um uh, the Hills DD food, for example, which is dermatology type food, they're heat treated foods, protein, protein hydrolyzed diets, and they're readily available. That's an easy way to do a feeding trial. Use those types of diets, choose the right ones. There's only a couple that are actually reliable. The other way you can do is to feed proteins to you, your dog that they've never had for a feeding trial. Okay, so because food allergies are based on experience what we're trying to do here is expose the body to either proteins your dog's never seen or proteins your dog can't recognize okay and there's only a, really three or four options here of, of things we can use for these foods the foods the novel diets can either be home prepared um, especially if you've got the time to prepare the foods if you want to make something home prepared and we can pick proteins and a carbohydrate source to add some uh, extra carbs so your dog doesn't lose too much weight we can do that um, and i can give you recipes on things that you can make that are going to be useful for a trial okay so this is what we're getting at basically novel protein protein diets or hydrolyzed diets okay so the novel protein diet you know i can either um recommend a roll you've probably seen these dog rolls made by a company called prime 100 all the vets and all the pet shops have them now you know, there's kangaroo and potato, there's um, venison and, uh, and uh, sweet potato, there's crocodile and tapioca, for example, um, those kinds of things. Some of them better than others. Um, that particular brand of food, um, there's a couple of um, their products that go through a production line. The production line is just dedicated to making that food only. Okay? And that's where these diets need to be critically sort of appraised is, is that food from a distinct production line of its own? Okay, because even if it's on a shared production line, unfortunately, there's no reliable way to know that that production line is clean when it's used. Okay, 
um, Royal Cannon make a product called um, uh, an allergenic and that's a really good uh, food that's great for feeding trials if, if people are open to using packaged foods as is what's called Purina HA because both of those companies have dedicated production lines for that food only. Okay. The analogenic food is actually made from feathers, believe it or not. Okay, so hydrolyzed feathers, which cannot be recognized as chicken protein at all. Um, just to lighten things up, I won't uh, tell you too much, Mark, but this yeah, is on the Danube we, River. Uh -huh. It looks yeah. beautiful. We did have a question. I forgot to turn my, myself off mute. Uh -huh. We did have a question on the Royal Cannon, what is it, analogenic yes. um, product. And I'll just yes. read it out straight to you. Is it worth continuing to feed the product if the dog is itchy again with dreadful skin and ears after having come good for months? Is it really a food allergy? Sure, okay. So what I'll get at with, with this is where we're going with this, and I'm gonna march along in a moment to this, is that you need some evidence to know the food was doing something to to decide whether to proceed with it okay there's no good just putting your dog on these foods and saying you know to your partner after a month sitting sitting at the dinner table do you reckon rufus is better do you think he's doing better on the food that's not a useful trial okay so putting your dog on that food and thinking well he was better that's all well and good but the thing you didn't do there is you didn't ever put him back on his old food and see for a flare up okay so by the stage of now asking me whether your dog should stay on the food now there could be a lot of infection on the skin. The skin barrier could be compromised, whereas before when you started the trial, it might have been healthy. So if food trials go, go on for too long, especially if you're not doing a re-challenge, if the longer they go on, the more chances you're going to get um, things like infection popping up. Okay, But long to the short, to stay on the food is not going to be harmful, but it's not giving you any information to just stay on that food. The thing you need to do is confirm the food allergy and then go back and do a re-challenge work out what it is in the food that your dog's allergic to if that re if that royal cannon food did give you improvement okay i'll go over that really well with you down the track here We've, so the new yeah yeah sorry um, i just want to warn you that i've booked the meeting time till 9 30. i don't know what happens with zoom if we go over i don't don't think they'll cut us off but if push right, comes we'll to see. shove we can just start another meeting okay that's all right uh, I think we'll, we'll get we'll get there. We'll get along. So this is the sort of um, numbers we're looking at for um, for allergies. Okay. So when we're looking for these proteins, a good number of single allergens, a couple a uh, couple of allergens, about forty percent, twenty percent, three or more allergens. So it pays to actually look for more than one allergen when we're doing these feeding trials. Okay. So the phase one of the trial is basically getting control of the symptoms. So controlling the itch, controlling the infections, uh, getting the skin barriers sorted out, starting the new food, okay? Then basically what we do is um, what we call the challenge phase, which is basically where we put the animal back onto its old food and look for the symptoms returning, okay? So you might feed the new diet for, say, four to six weeks, or in the old-fashioned way, it was eight weeks. Then we're going to basically support your dog with itch medications like cytopointer, like apoquel or even prednisolone during that period. We take the prednisolone or cytopointer or apoquel away during that time. We see how your dog holds up just on the food. If it holds up well without the drugs there, then we say, all right, let's see if this diet actually did anything. And we re-challenge your diet by putting it back on its old food. You're looking for recurrence of the symptoms, okay? That's evidence that we have a food allergy, okay? The next step here is, right, we've got symptoms Coming back, um, when we put your back dog back on the the low allergen food again, do this do the symptoms resolve again? Okay, and during this time we try to keep everything the same. So, for example, while you're doing a feeding trial, you wouldn't take your dog to a new park. You wouldn't um, use different shampoo. You wouldn't start it or stop it on antibiotics. It's just got to be done methodically. Okay, it takes a bit of patience at your end, but it's worthwhile doing thoroughly. Okay, so we just talked about this basically. So some medication, control infections, reduce inflammation, etc. at the start. Get the skin really healthy. Choose a diet. Run the feed trial. Four to eight weeks. Depends on which drug. 
different drugs we're using. For example, if we use prednisolone, which is a, a got a bad reputation as a drug, prednisolone is a great way to shorten a diet trial. Okay, the rechallenge is the, the the most important part of a diet trial. If we're not doing that rechallenge at the end of your diet trial, the whole thing is a waste of time. Okay, and I get clients coming to me every day, and I say, "Did your vet do a diet trial?" And they say, "Yeah, did a diet trial, didn't do anything." I say. Tell me what you did at the end of the diet trial. Well, I gave up on it because I didn't get any benefit. Okay. So a lot of the time, unless you've actually done the re-challenge at the end of the diet trial, you don't know whether the food was actually giving you any benefit because things didn't get better and then get a whole lot worse when you put them back on the old food. Which food to use? You can make the food. In America, there's a culture of using pinto beans and lentils. That's something they use. We use a lot of sweet potato, kangaroo and sweet potato, or kangaroo and potato. This is the Prime 100 food I was talking about. Um, Purina, HA, Royal Cannon, they make these hypoallergenic food. Royal Cannon, Analogenics, Hills make a food. <clears throat> Some people have busy lifestyle, these packaged things are a way to go. But the food's got to be chosen carefully. Of all the packaged foods, really, that there's only two choices that we can use for diet trials that we know are reliable, and they're actually not on this screen. So the things to talk about carefully with your dermatologist. So the, the re-challenge is really once you've basically had your animal on the, the prescription diet or the or the homemade food that's the novel protein diet, we get to this period of saying, right, we've got everything stable, we're living okay without the support drug we had in the first, say, four weeks, about eight weeks. The re-challenge is we will do this smorgasbord, which we're putting everything in front of your dog that they've ever eaten, okay, so, and a good way to do this is, is simply to just go and buy a bag of optimum dog food from the supermarket, because that's got every ingredient that you can have, really, it's, it's got a lot of different protein sources, and feed them that, feed them some home-cooked foods. For about two weeks during that time, we're looking for reactions, okay, and when we're talking about our itch scale, you know, from zero to 10, most of the time when we do that re-challenge, we're looking for itching going to about five out of 10 at least, from what's effectively been zero. And it's usually the happiest day of the dog's life because it's been eating this pretty bland prescription diet or home packaged food every day, or homemade food. All of a sudden they get to have this wonderful small sport and they're pretty damn happy. So we're looking for changes in the itching level, okay? You also might see changes in the number of poos they're having, farting, tummy rumbles, mucoid stools, you know, butt in the stool, that sort of stuff, okay? Very obvious signs, you should see them. Okay, so then the next step is to say, right, we had this massive breakdown, my dog came up itching. Well, what we do is then we put them, we put them back on the, the uh, elimination diet, which is the analogenic food or the packaged food or the homemade stuff, which was the novel protein. And then we'll get the itching under control with um, a drug, either it's usually gonna be say Apoquil that's used most of the time for this sort of thing use the drug to settle them down. And then we'll basically trial a new ingredient for about seven to 10 days, okay? And we work through a list of ingredients, okay? So for example, what you would do initially would be to have about three quarters of the diet being the, the packaged food, the, the uh, novel protein diet, if you like. And we'd add in beef as say 20%, 25% thereabouts of the meal for the next seven to 10 days. Okay, you work through that and you say, well, his itch went from zero to 50 while he was on beef. You add that to your list. Then we take the beef out and we move on to the next ingredient, which is going to be dairy, and we move on to wheat, and we move on to chicken, soy, and so on. So once you get through this list, you start to compose a fairly comprehensive, uh, I guess, group of allergens. Okay, And that list is based in order of likelihood. So beef is going to be the most likely, followed by lamb, dairy, wheat, and so on. Okay, So it's worth working through the list. And then we need a plan, right? You've got this list, identify the ingredients. Life is easy, okay? You then work out what you need to feed your dog. You don't feed it peanut, peanuts if it's peanut allergic, okay? Life's easy if you've got a food allergic dog, okay? If you've got an atopic dog, basically if your food allergy uh, feeding trial fails in that it doesn't identify that your dog's food allergic, well, the sad news is you've got an atopic dog, okay? So then you're basically going to be, depending on the anti-itch medications, so your cytokines, your apoquels, um, maybe some prednisolone. Um, we're either managing your dog 
basically by controlling the infections, controlling the skin barrier, or you might choose to go down the path of desensitization, which is basically where we do the skin allergy testing and um, then go forward and make you a vaccine and desensitize your dog. And when I said, what I've said here is life is easy if you've got a food allergic dog. Really, that is the truth. Life is going to be really easy. Food allergy, once you identify it, you have a first aid kit at home with some steroid in case someone feeds your dog uh, hypothetically some beef at a barbecue and it's allergic to beef. Have some prednisolone on hand that you can give the dog, settle it down so you don't get a flare up. And now, um, it, now yeah. it might be a good, several people have asked about Cytopoint. It must be yep. the new flavour of the month drug or the new do, uh, drug on the market. Um, and thereafter, your thoughts on where it fits into the picture. Sure. In, in what context? Into food allergies? Uh, they've just been general questions. Um, are there... So, is, is, so what are your thoughts about it? Is the quality of drug, right? Yep. And, and mm -hmm. uh, so they're injections. So, yeah, yep. so basically it was... A, and then... Um, there's another one with respect to using it with um, anal fununculosis. Have I got the pronunciation right? Okay. No, no, that's... Uh, Sylvia might want to... I might see if I can... So, um, so just to give you guys a bit of a... I guess a plan that I might um, lay out here is I've pretty much um, finished what I wanted to go through to you guys. I just wanted to touch on ATP and maybe in that I can talk to you briefly about Cytopoint. But maybe in, a, in say two or three minutes we'll wind this up and we'll open the floor to questions. What do you think, Mark? Because it yep. sounds like there's a few, yep, a few it's, there. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, there's a few there and it's nine minutes, yep. uh, 9.18. Yep. Yeah, sure. All right, so if I just, just whiz you through this basically, um, if you've got an atopic dog, life can be easy. You know, we desensitise them. I think for years, um, uh, a lot of clients have had in their in their minds that desensitising and testing for environmental allergies is the silver bullet to to fixing the dog's allergies. Okay, and I like I never like to mislead people in the in the regard that by allergy testing your dog, we're going to get a fix. Okay. In about three quarters of dogs, we're going to get benefit from desensitizing them. Okay, so that's when we do these. Basically, we do these skin testing, um, and we make you up a vaccine that you give every three weeks at home, basically. And we can give that either by injection or oral syrup. And you know, this is sort of the numbers we're talking about. With 20% of dogs will get no benefit from immunotherapy over after using it for two years. Okay, and this we'll talk about side point in a moment. But the support drugs we're using with with um, supporting atopic dogs are drugs like Cytopoint, Apoquel, steroids. Um, at times you're going to need to use antibiotics, antifungals. But with all that support in place while your vaccine's working, after two years you'd expect that 20% of the dogs get off all their drugs and they're basically just using the vaccine only. Um, and the middle 60% basically get reasonable benefit from the vaccines. They're depending less on those drugs like cytokine, apical and antibiotics and that kind of stuff. And then you get 20% of the dogs to get no benefit at all from vaccines, okay? So there's the vaccines we're talking about. This is actually a skin test kit. Um, this is um, actually running the skin test on a, on a big dog, which is a, a couple of months ago. Sort of reactions we're looking for. That's a, a test kit uh, sheep. This is recording the responses that uh, this dog, Ben Clark, had a few weeks ago uh, in August. Uh, and from that, we compose our vaccine, which I'm sure, sure some of you guys have seen. There's kind of vaccines which you guys will administer. And then every three days, thereabouts, for a little while, and we go every three weeks ongoing. Okay. All right, so let's open the floor. Hey, this is Vienna Zoo, by the way, right in the heart of the city. There's a zoo that's got giraffes in it, and it looks really out of place, but it's pretty cool to be able to go there. Uh, question, please. So back to the the anal fununculosis, have I got it right? Is, yeah, anal fununculosis, yes. Is there an option rather than uh, cyclosporin, which uh, I gather is an expensive um, treatment? Uh, Cytopoint, Cytopoint is not an option for treating that disease, okay? 
So you remember we talked about all the, the causes of itch, okay, and they release these things called interleukin-31 30, and uh, other cytokines that drive itch. Well, what cytokine is, it's an antibody that's been cloned up in mice. So the mice are basically injected with interleukin-31. The mice make a lot of antibody against that protein. Basically, then what we're doing is harvesting all of that antibody and we're putting it into a bottle that's, and, and we're making it suitable for the dog to have. So when we administer cytopoint injection, it's just a heap of antibody we're giving to your dog. And what it's there to do is just, its only purpose is to soak up interleukin-31. It just binds to it and neutralizes it. So interleukin-31, the itch signaling chemical, cannot signal itch to the brain. Okay, So it's going to do nothing at all for uh, anal bronchiolosis. So uh, that's... Foreign. Yeah. So that's cyclosporin. Cyclosporin for anal fununculosis is not the way to go, or have I been to be No, it is. Other... No, absolutely. So absolutely. cyclosporin is it's the mainstay of treating anal fununculosis, at least at the start. So prednisolone, <laughs> antibiotics, cyclosporin, and, it... and top and topical cyclosporin as well. And then we move on to trying not to depend on the the um, oral cyclosporin and using creams um, around the anal area. But, and there yeah, are no of, options, to, no other more cost-effective options to use? Uh, there are. So the idea would be to get off cyclosporin, okay, um, once you've got the condition under control and depend more on topical treatments. And there's okay. some really economical topical treatments that we can get through the human market that can make that condition really cheap to treat. Right, okay. Um, we've had a couple of questions on what we're weaning puppies onto, uh, and and somebody spoke of early weaning. I'm not quite sure if they meant early weaning, as in, we, you know, the first foods we introduce to to puppies. Mm. Yes, yeah, so it's it's quite contentious. Um, I'm not a nutritionist, um, but certainly um, when it comes to allergies. Um, we've got to be careful that um, we're feeding food that's good quality versus food that's homemade and of questionable quality. I guess um, the hard part is that most of the, the, the information that we get as vets and your average vet, uh, most of what he or she knows about nutrition has been presented to them by uh, pet food companies. Okay. And the problem um, the is... Yeah. That when you even go in and look at some of the papers from from veterinary seminars and things like that, a lot of those are still presented by people who are in fact working for the commercial food companies, which is something I've found a bit frustrating. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I tried to get, um, when I had my vet practice, I tried to get a veterinary nutritionist to come in and train all my nurses on nutrition that was independent. And we had one, her name was Virginia Studdett. She was in Victoria, based at Melbourne Uni, and she's no longer. Um, there's, a, there's a veterinary nutritionist up in Queensland, um, but really they're, they're few and far between. So what I'm getting at is, um, I think um, with regard to what to wean puppies on, um, that's something I think you've got to make your own minds up on. But I think the hard part is to, to find food that's going to be nutritionally really effective for growth. And the great thing is I think that as much as there is bias and there's, um, there's maybe a hidden agenda for, for pet food companies, the good quality foods that are made by more reputable sort of premium grade um, pet food companies are somewhat evidence-based. And you could argue, yes, the evidence is confounded by their own agenda, but um, they have shown results in their, in their feeding. Um, as for allergy, as for allergy development, you know, um, there's there's propensity there to develop allergies to, to those foods, and also um, there is also propensity to develop allergies to um, homemade foods. And I'm a big fan of um, of homemade food for for puppies, as long as you've got all the bases covered and and it's balanced and it's got vitamins and minerals they need. God feed what you you think is right, because um, there's no one fits all sort of recipe. So I sort of have a question myself within the context you were talking about hydrolyzed um, feather meal, which was always something was as as a ex stock feed chemist fascinated me as a raw material because it analyzes very well 
but it's not nutritionally available. So my question for you, the protein out of the hydro, well, I, I, I guess you're saying you're not a nutritionist, but it sort of fascinates me that the proteins out of a hydrolyzed feather meal, are they still going to be absorbed and utilized? I mean, sure, they're not going to, they're potentially not allergens, but are they going to be available? Yep, so they're absorbed as amino acids, okay? Okay. And the body does get to use them. Um, certainly animals that stay on those diets long-term, I personally wouldn't have an animal on one of those diets long-term of my own because the dogs tend to lose weight on them, okay? And they'll also tend to lose weight on any of these what we call single-protein diets. So these these kind of diets here, you know, like you feed a dog just on kangaroo and potato, well, yeah, they don't maintain weight. And these are not balanced diets, okay? The manufacturers will claim they are, but if you look at the ingredients, there's a fairly small spectrum of ingredients um, and they just don't, they just don't um, provide as much nutrition as you'd like. So, um, yeah. Okay. These, so I someone, don't see these, yeah. Sorry. Someone's, so, so moving off something unusual to something perhaps more common there's a question here asking about the role of venison or game meat i guess yeah novel it just says what about i assume you didn't include that within your novel protein options yeah you would but then venison we've got to be aware of what we call cross reactivity rule of these diets okay now venison cross reacts with um, goat meat and also cross reacts with sheep meat antigenically which means that when the immune system comes across venison or comes across sheep meat venison lamb and goat basically they all look the same okay so venison is only of limited use you know from a i guess from a from an outsider perspective we think that venison sounds exotic and quite different to lamb or to goat but really as far as the immune system goes using venison venison as an elimination diet is not that useful Okay. Okay. Then we've got a question here about can improving gut flora help allergies or once they are present, is it too late to change a leaky gut? I think you so yeah. maybe treat so, that as to ask the first part of the question yeah. <laughs> because I think that's interesting and then combine it would be a good way to approach yeah, so it. This is probiotics, yeah? Gut well, it just says gut flora yeah. and improving yeah, so, gut flora. Certainly some of the clinical signs you might be able to improve. For example, if you've got a dog that's um, got mucoid stools or is not um, able to um, maintain good cook stool consistency, you might improve it with probiotics. But you're not going to, that structural change and the, the allergenicity of, um, of the gut um, is not going to be changed by probiotics. Okay. Um, the only way to really change the reactivity, a bit like exposing a peanut allergic person to peanuts um, and getting that response, you need to change the diet to really get a, a response um, dialed down. That hypersensitivity is not going to go away with probiotics, it's still going to be there. Okay, so the probiotics are not going to change the, the picture of a food allergy dog because it's already present. Yes, yeah, um, you've got the structural change there, yeah. Uh, do you think that early dissecting has any input into autoimmune, autoimmune problems like alopecia? Uh, from what I understand, there's not a lot of evidence to support that there's, a, that there's a, an issue with um, early dissecting broadly. There are some diseases, though, certainly that, um, for example, hormone responsive alopecias that do pop up from early dissecting that we do see desexing by and large, whether it's early or late. So yeah, desexing has implications broadly, but I don't have a, um, uh, an opinion for or against it. I think it's a personal choice and I don't think it's make or break. You know, we don't see a lot of, there's certainly the very rare conditions we see that pop up with, with in dermatology, that is conditions we see relating to desexing are particularly rare. You know, I'd be lucky to see one a year that relates to a desexing kind of complaint. Right. So, yeah. so on yeah. sticking with the alopecia, does a blue dog automatically have some degree of dilute colour alopecia? Yes. Who's asking this one? Is it is it a staffy owner? 
No, I, no, I think it's someone with a broad understanding of canine health concepts generally. Yes, yeah, so forgive me for that, Mark. What was the question again? Oh, does a blue dog automatically have some degree of dilute colour alopecia? So not all blue dogs will get colour dilution alopecia, okay? Um, interestingly, you know, look at a Weimaraner. Weimaraners, uh, the blue coat colour in a Weimaraner does not lend itself to developing colour dilution alopecia, okay? So colour dilution alopecia is... Um, if you consider the way a hair, a hair shaft uh, is formed, it's formed in sac, uh, which basically is the, the capsule of the, um, the hair root. And as the hair grows in this sac as a, a big um, ball of keratin, basically, it grows upwards from a base and it's extruded out through a follicle opening, what we call the ostea of the follicle. Now, as, it's, as it grows, there's um, at the very base of the hair follicle is um, a, a group of cells called melanocytes, and they insert melanin pigment granules into the hair shaft so that in the cortex, the outer, outer um, layer of the hair follicle, that pigment is distributed evenly. Okay, so when the hair grows out for a black hair or for a brown hair, there's so much pigment put in it, it needs to be spread apart so that that melanin doesn't form clumps. Okay, the trouble with these color dilution dogs that have color dilution alopecia is that the way they form their melanin and lay it down in the hair is disordered and it forms clumps that are particularly large and they'll distort, dis, they'll actually distort the hair shaft and as the hair is growing, it will actually um, uh, grow out and, and the hair shaft will be angled and sharply bent and they become weak points where those clumps occur. Okay. Now, not every blue dog gets colour dilution alopecia, but the colour dilution mutant gene, we call it, as a particular um, locus of a gene, when that um, mutant occurs, the colour dilution mutant will throw off so many animals to becoming um, uh, predisposed to forming those defective hairs. Okay, so not every colour dilute dog will be, become colour dilute alopecia um, and, and have the hairs break, but but certainly blue dogs uh, have that propensity. Of, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you'll see it. Okay, back to um, something you alluded to when you were talking about the boxes. Are mast cell tumours connected to immunity deficiencies? Not deficiencies. So They're predis certain breeds are predisposed, as, as everybody knows, the boxer, the humble boxer, certainly does um, have uh, the highest likelihood of, um, as do Labrador retrievers, of, of getting mast cell tumors. Yeah, yeah. Not, Labradors not so much we're talking about here. Yeah, yeah huge numbers. Um, we don't see them as being immunodeficient. That's not why they're getting the mast cell tumors. A bit like... Um, you know, certain types of um, dogs, for example, to develop other types of tumours. They're predisposed to tumours, but it doesn't mean they've got a, a weak immune system. Okay, so a bit of a more general question here. Um, do you have some comments on breeding and rearing strategies to reduce ATP in a population, um, perhaps particularly relating to early diet and environmental exposure with baby puppies and pregnant bitches? Well, we know that um, ATP and allergies have come about uh, and, 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 and have evolved and increased as animals have become uh, more indoor lifestyle based um, and have become sort of city based animals. So animals that live in a rural environment have a far reduced uh, propensity to develop ATP. Okay. So if you were to have animals um, hypothetically reared in a, a, a better ventilated environment where you're getting um, more exposure to allergens through their development uh, and not in this sort of padded cell environment, you're going to get less ATP coming on. Okay. So yeah. animals that live, for example, in yeah, urban environments where you've got carpets, you've got dust mites, you've got um, a lot of pollens accumulating, um, they're going to be 
the havens for, to, for developing ATV, but there's nothing, certainly we don't have any guidelines as to how you can rear a dog that's going to reduce its chance of ATV, but certainly like a rural environment dog, dogs that live on farms get far less ATV. Yeah. Yep. Uh, what about the role of vitamin C in, um, well, I'll ask two questions in one here, vitamin C and kelp. Uh, don't know. From my understanding, not particularly relevant, but if anybody has information on the contrary, I'd be wrapped to know. Well, it would be a case of what they're contributing, I would imagine, kelp being a fairly complex um, complex <laughs> vegetable, I suppose. Um, right. Uh, do, do, do. Oh, I've lost the, qu the question I had. Um, Oh, how do you confirm lupus versus other dermatological conditions that present with similar clinical signs? Okay. Is it, some of these are very open questions, but it's nice, I guess, to um, explain things. Um, so, you know, we talk, talked earlier about um, some, of the, some of the workup we do for allergies, you know, um, and uh, a lot of it involves um, lab work that's done in the clinic, you know, for example, on a microscope, so it's what we call cytology, which is surface um, sampling in the clinic. And sometimes for some conditions like lupus or like um, amphigus, for example, we don't need to do any further testing beyond the microscope and, and looking at the animal to, to diagnose them, okay? Um, discoid lupus especially, which is the most, the most common um, uh, autoimmune disease that we can um, diagnose. You can look at, at three different dogs with um, nasal ulceration or nasal depigmentation, and you can assume, especially given that they're all border collies or they're all bearded collies or some sort of collie breed, you could say, well, they've probably all got lupus. Okay, but at the end of the day, the, the really de de definitive way to diagnose lupus in those animals, or um, or vasculitis or a pemphigus case, you really need a biopsy, okay? And the biopsies aren't just taken on the day, we need to make sure that all of the fuzz, all the secondary infection, all of this stuff, this bacterial infection or yeast infection is out of the picture. So normally what we do is put those animals on antibiotics for a week, 10 days prior to a biopsy, get a really good biopsy or, or five or six without disfiguring the animal too much, send it to a laboratory that's got a dermatohistopathologist that just does skin, biopsy um, analysis and get you a definitive diagnosis, okay, rather than a morphological diagnosis based on appearance. Okay, a uh, question about dogs eating dirt or clay, is this a sign of GI issues? Yeah, there is some speculation that uh, ingestion of dirt, ingestion of grass, um, especially uh, there, are, there are tables that I have in textbooks that talk about ingestion of grass and dirt as being um, more likely signs of food allergies and um, they sort of feature on the list of gastrointestinal signs we need to be aware of. So that's certainly something that we need to take account of. In a questionnaire when I'm talking to a client about uh, the propensity of their or the likelihood of their dogs having a food allergy, those indicators are quite low down on the list of um, kind of key things we need to know about. Certainly, I talked about the number of bowel movements a day, the number of poos a day, that's a really high indicator. So bowel movements, um, farting, tummy rumbles, and fecal mucus are really massive um, contributors for evidence. The things like eating grass, some of that's behavioral, and there's an element of, you know, question there is, when, when, when you tell me that sort of information, I've got to say, well, a lot of dogs will actually eat grass that are actually don't have a food allergy, so let's not focus too much on that. But if you say to me that my dog's got fecal mucus and he does three poos a day and he eats a lot of grass and dirt, I say, well, maybe that evidence is kind of going to go with the rest of the party there and, and provide a bit more support. Yep. Uh, what a, uh, this is a bit of a general question. Do you think um, over-vaccination plays any part in autoimmune problems? Um... Certainly we know in the human field that there is evidence for that, yeah, um, that, that overpriming the immune system um, can have um, deleterious effects. Um, in dogs and cats, um, 
most of the vaccine induced issues we see uh, are idiosyncratic. They're not. They're not. Um, uh, in the past, we've seen um, issues with, for example, for cats. We've seen vaccine induced sarcomas. Um, in dogs, we tend to see, um, for example, I've got two dogs at the moment that have vaccine induced vasculitis in their puppies. So I've got a 12 week old puppy, a 14 week old puppy thereabouts, and they've both had um, vaccine induced vasculitis has come on at six to eight weeks of age. But over vaccinating per se, I don't think is so much of an issue um, that we're seeing at least that's that's hitting the, um, the papers and getting written up, but certainly vaccinations and drug reactions by and large are a real problem, okay? It doesn't mean we shouldn't vaccinate, it's a bit like, a bit like coronavirus, you know, would you get the vaccine? What's worse, the vaccine or the disease? I'd probably rather, most of the time, I'd probably take the vaccine over the disease that we're trying to protect. Yeah, 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 then you get caught up in a... In a, a debate. A debate, but, but, but I think that um, perhaps we really need to, we have the opportunity with the TETA testing to be exploring the real genuine role or degree of yeah. vaccination that's required. Whether there's a need, whether there's a yeah. need, that's right. I used to do, for example, was a, a puppy at the moment that, um, that I know had a reaction to its distemper the hepatitis parvo vaccine. And, you know, that dog's going to be on probably for the rest of its life. It's one of the hardest types, types of vasculitis to manage. You know, it's been on the medication now for about three months and it's going to be on medication for the rest of its life. Um, and that dog will never be vaccinated um, against parvovirus. Um, and, uh, and that's a real shame because it's, um, thankfully they live in a, a better part of town and we're relying on uh, you know, the, the pool of vaccinated dogs, if you like, to protect that dog. But, um, yeah, we're going to be blood testing the dog and just seeing what its titers are, and, and you know, every year, and just seeing see whether there's any need to sort of do any. Even a killed parvo vaccine could be an option for that dog. But but that's a very different circumstance where you had a a new uh, a puppy dog being exposed to a vaccine for the first time, as opposed to adult dogs getting repeat vaccinations when in fact the immunity is probably already as good as yeah. it's going to get different stories. Yeah, and we know, I mean, um, we, we know fairly well that titers of dogs, I mean, you, you know, if you, you, know, you were talking about this with me today, that a lot of titers are being done now with big question marks by pet owners and even um, uh, by parents in the human world of um, asking doctors whether their kids really need the vaccines, you know, and they're asking for these titers. And, um, I'm not a huge believer in vaccines. Um, I don't know the titers. I haven't run titers for years. I used to run quite a lot on dogs. Um, but yeah, I'd be surprised if um, if everyone got their dogs um, antibody titers measured every year, which is basically the counts of the antibodies that we're trying to keep up with these repeated vaccines. If we got them measured, I think you'd find your dog didn't need annual vaccinations. Now, they certainly don't. And beyond a certain age too, I don't know the numbers, but dogs don't need vaccinating as they get older, by and large, okay? It's certainly a precaution. I think the bit, the best thing about the vaccinations that, that I can see is that dogs are coming into the vet at least once a year to get checked for other stuff that might, might be probably yeah. more important. And, yeah. and, and, of course, there's a, a lack of understanding, and I'm talking within the human world, of actually how vaccines work and what they do to the immune system to become effective anyhow and whether that's the the impact rather than the vaccine per se. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yep. Um, someone here has <laughs> asked if there was evidence that eucalyptus treatments reduce the prevalence of dust mite. So... Mm. Um, maybe that's a that's a question we can talk about over the phone. I'm not quite sure what's meant by eucalyptus treatment. Um, whether they're talking about um, humidifiers with eucalyptus treatment. Um, uh, if that's if that's the sort of angle we're talking about, you know, we have strategies that um, when I've got a client that has a dog that a uh, dog or a cat that has um, house dust mite allergies, we use routines in the house that can help to reduce the the load of house dust mite in the house and eucalyptus soil may have been spruced as a solution to killing off house dust mite. I'm guessing yeah. this is maybe yeah. the angle. Yeah, yeah, that's um, that's the angle utilising it yeah. as a... So, 
Yeah, I think that's probably reasonable. You know, I'm sure eucalyptus oil is not going to be um, loved by how stuff might, but it may not be the most effective um, and evidence kind of based way to kill an insect. And and what you know, about yeah. frequency of shampooing? Generally, for, as an, you mean in in the context in, of allergies? Oh well, well. Does frequency of shampooing dogs affect atopy? Um, no. I would say that fairly bravely. I think that's a, a fairly strong no. Um, it doesn't affect the development of the disease, um, but it's going to affect um, management. So animals that have atopy, you know, this, the allergens for atopy are either inhaled or they're going to be absorbed through their skin. Okay. Now, for the animals that have them absorbed through the skin, which is going to be most of the dogs, washing those dogs regularly, especially during the high season, if they're on immunotherapy and, and they're on all supportive drugs, by washing them, we're diluting the allergens off their skin. Okay. I just, so. I've just realised we could unshare your screen and you could have been talking to us face to face. Sorry. Yeah, Scroll, scrolling through to tidy up on the questions. Um, okay, is it possible to do? Yeah, you just unshare your screen. Oh, oh maybe wow. I, yeah, maybe I need to put you back to host for a minute, and then you can unshare your screen. Okay, thanks. Oh, you go. It says stop. Yeah, okay. yeah, I know. I should have. Is that anyone was... still awake? Are people still here? Hey. All right. Oh no, we've still got quite a few people here, uh, okay. but I have, I am just scrolling through to tidy up on the questions. Yeah. I th we are here, says, oh, somebody, Bridget. Um, I'm, impressed, so I'm just, impressed that people have stayed awake this long. <laughs> GI I didn't think it was that interesting. Oh, it's, a, it's been a very interesting evening, thank you. GI issues in older, uh, GI issues in older dogs more common, a part of ageing perhaps. Have a thirteen-year-old just started eating grass, but no other symptoms. Um, I suspect not. Um, certainly, when it comes to allergies, that is um, allergies. You know, um, as unless um, you, you didn't conquer the allergy, if the dog has a food allergy and you continue to feed the same offending allergens. A bit like exposing yourself to peanuts or bees repeatedly, repeatedly, you're going to get anaphylaxis ultimately. Okay, so um, when in the context of allergy, yes, allergy is going to become more dramatic as far as the allergic response to the wrong foods with time. But um, GRT disease, um, you know, you think of the obvious, obvious things like gut lymphoma um, coming on more with age, but Apart from allergy, GRT disease, I don't think um, is more likely with age necessarily. I think it's it's an individual uh, unfortunate circumstance. I, I can share cute parallels when my elderly mother lived with me and who had very good health into her 90s. And we also had an older dog at the time. And, you know, I just think like the rest of our body, the gut gets a bit slower as it gets older so you need to go with the higher fiber so perhaps the yeah. 13 year old dog knows what's good for him and in, to be really honest as my dog headed on into mid-teens i just increased the fiber in his diet and maintained i'm a big fan of the poo count like you um the right sort of number in the day and I, I think so. Maybe the older grass eating dog knows what he's doing to look after himself. Yeah, yeah to, to purge. Yeah, 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 that's mm. right. Um, we've had some questions about um, inheritance of atopy. Uh, I've lost the question now. Um, so, what happens if you breed a dog? with atopy what are the chances of the puppies having issues i just lost the question sorry yeah no i get, I get the general gist the heritability if you like yeah. of yeah. the condition um that's something i'd need to um, look up for you from from what i'm aware i'm not sure we've actually got especially well in the derm in the derm um 
fraternity where we've got much inheritability as far as numbers go. Uh, I know that we know of breeds based on um, retrospective findings. That's where all those breed predisposition lists come from is these are the breeds we know get the conditions. Yep. But I'm not sure how much we know about if you breed two staffies, for example, English staffies that, that have A to B, whether you're likely to produce an English staffy um, as an offspring. Um, there's a, a big environmental component here that needs to be considered when we're talking about heritability. It's not just the breeds, but it's um, it's what comes after they're born. You know, and, and I, th I think we can't assume that there's 100% heritability just because you breed two atopic staffies together. Okay, well, I think but, I've... But, if I, yes, if I may just say one more thing on that, sorry. Um, the thing I'd suggest is also though, if you've got a, a condition in, in a dog that's genetically, uh, that they're pre genetically predisposed to, such as um, retained testicles, and this is going to create contention, I can just feel it already, um, or um, some of the, for example, rare heart conditions, you know, obviously you wouldn't think to breed that dog again. And I do see a lot of it, you know, we, just, we see animals being bred that have produced offspring that have had certain conditions. So for example, if you get a dog that's got atopy um, and, uh, or elbow dysplasia or hip dysplasia, you'd know that if you can improve the genetics of those dogs or choose not to breed from certain dogs, well, that'd be the wise choice because you're certainly gonna have less likelihood of getting offspring with the same condition if you don't breed with them at all. <laughs> Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh, look, I think that I've scrolled up and down. You've already left the invitation to um, uh, follow up with questions. So I think there's just one last one that I'll ask before we wind up. And somebody has just typed in hot, hot spots question mark. So perhaps some wind up thoughts for that. <laughs> sure, hot spots. Okay. Where do we go with hotspots? Um, so um, with regard to hotspots, maybe can that person give you a bit of context on, on the question? I would imagine that having looked after a, um, a Facebook group that had some health issues and hotspots and you hear the various thoughts on how to treat them. so. Um, ah, Kathy's saying to me how to avoid them. Okay. Um, well, there are certain breeds that are going to be predisposed to pyoderma, okay, and you guys probably know about them. Um, German Shepherds are a classic um, for um, uh, recurrent pyoderma, and they're particularly hard to treat uh, and, and prevent. Um, they're the sort of dogs that we're using. Vaccines um, are making a number of vaccines for dogs at the moment that are designed to boost the immune system's uh, responses against those bacteria and keep them in check so you don't get them. But basically, for dogs that get recurrent hotspots, I've got a friend, for example, has got a Newfoundland, I caught up with her on the weekend, a dog's got another hotspot. Um, it's all about hygiene. So basically, um, regular bathing without being too regular, you need the right amount of grease in the coat and there's no perfect amount of bathing I can suggest that every dog needs, okay? But, we're talking, you know, maybe for some dogs fortnightly bathing, maybe monthly, maybe for some of them no bathing, okay? And with the right shampoos, what you really want to do is, um, I guess, understand that the, the, the hot spots are going to be partly genetic, partly environmental, so it's going to be coming down to the weather conditions, the moisture, the humidity in the hair coat, the amount of grease. So bathing's part of the, the, the preventative um, strategy um, and really fast, um, response to shutting down those um, hot spots when they start to, to appear. So just being really observant, having a first aid kit at home, even if it's just some chlorhexidine spray or some air court to put on them straight off. A lot of my clients that get recurrent hot spots in their dogs, I'll make sure they've got a first aid kit at home that has antibiotics and some steroids and some chlorhexidine in it. <laughs> so hopefully that okay. kind of answers the question. There's no, there's no real um, preventative that I can guarantee is going to work for every dog, but certainly there's a whole realm of strategies we've got that can work. Okie dokie. Well, um, if you want to unshare your screen now, Dan, and mm -hmm. um, now how do I 
or am I resetting the host? And I'm back to. I think it'd be nice if everyone could show their faces, but there's a lot of names here. Yeah, there, there are a lot of names here. I was going to, so I'm, re I'm sure they've shown the setup here. So basically, yes, I'm still awake. I ho a few of us have left the meeting and um, there's some great responses to say thank you very much for a, Thanks, guys. a really interesting evening. So I have now found my PowerPoint slides that I couldn't find before. You've already uh, beat me to it with a really nice share about the sort of um, information and support that you're able to provide. I have a question for you about the way you're running your practice in that, um, yes, you're doing your telemedicine options through COVID, is it something that you might think to um, continue in a post-COVID environment when we get there? Yeah. So telemedicine works okay. I did some telemedicine today, for example. It takes a long time to do the consultations. I think it's good for, especially for people in regional areas, like I've got some clients in Tasmania and I was consulting with a lady in Bendigo today that telemedicine works well for, but I think initially you need to see the dog, okay? So I think there's nothing like having your hands on um, the dog. Some of the telemedicine can work all right when I've got someone that's say, say maybe like you, Marg, that I can say, right, can you can you have a look at the foot? Is the foot looking okay? Can you pick up on lesions? Once I've educated the client on the basics of how to pick up their own animal's problems and diagnose what's going on, that's when telemedicine I think works really well. If you've got someone that's pretty astute and able to work with the dog and see things easily, Sometimes we need the vet to play a role with telemedicine. So I might say, well, look, I, I, I need your vet. If say they're in Bendigo or they're in God knows Tasmania, I need your vet to take me a really reliable sample of that foot and look under the microscope because I want to know if that's got yeast or bacteria on it. So, so t t telemedicine really has a, a, a place. Um, I think it's a good support tool and it's obviously the preferred way to work is to have animals coming in. I think going forward, like telemedicine is going to, take over but i think um it just to, to some degree it's going to have more of a place than it did before because it's become we've developed i guess a, become become used to using it but i think as my preferred tool the thing i'd love to have is hands on the dog and a client in the room that i can draw pictures for yeah. and explain but, things too well but it certainly opens up opportunities that um that you know people who ha who ha genuinely have distance uh, issues or perhaps yeah. might come down to uh, Melbourne Metro as we are now record now called and um, for the first visit but then get support visits up yeah. in their regional areas yeah yeah the thing I've been doing with telemedicine um, in Launceston um, recently is is the telemedicine is done with the vet in the clinic with the client okay so so obviously at the moment it's hard because the client can't go to the clinic, but I do telemedicine with the vets while we've got the animal there. Yep. yep. And that really helps because it means the vet can do all the work. I can give them a few pointers on how to manage the case and that works wonderfully well. Yep. And you're, um, and, and you're back to that sort of team approach that you were talking about early on in your presentation. Yeah, that's right. Yep. Yeah. All right. Well, it's been a great night. Thank you very much for Thanks, all Amy. your contributions. And, um, I do hear from my good sources that you are rather fond of a, of a red wine, so we might oh, find wow. something to follow on, but I can't guarantee it'll be a Grange. <laughs> so. um, now, while I've got you guys here, thanks everyone for attending. I appreciate you um, you know, um, giving me your attention with time. Sorry it was a bit fast or a bit, bit slow at times, but it's um, hard to accommodate everyone's needs. Um, the thing I guess I would um, like to echo is that if, if, if you guys are open to having more of these presentations, I really enjoy it. I enjoy it. Yes, it's a little bit a um, uh, bit of an adventure to go and, um, um, you know, present a topic that's a bit contentious, I think, and often it creates a lot of debate. And I haven't heard all the shouting or all of the, all the big kind of you know, exclamation marks. But if you guys 
think of a topic that you might think be, could be useful and you want to present it to Margaret and to say to Margaret, look, I want Dan to present a topic that's on this particular type of germ condition. If it's something that's going to be useful for everybody, I'd be wrapped to, to present your whole presentation if that's, if that's useful. Yep, that'd be great. So. Terrific. All right, now on my screen is doing stupid things again. Here we go. So, yes, thank you, everybody. It's been great. You can, we could actually roll through. We've dwindled a little in the past half hour or so, but it's, yes, it's been a wonderful presentation. And thank you, everyone, for um, attending. Thank you. All right. Thanks, guys. Rest up. <laughs>